Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lei. I'm one of the co-chair for this uh, US Clever blocking workshop. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see you all here. And I'll do a very brief uh, introduction, um, and then we'll start our first presentation. So um, this is our flyer, and I, I want to give you a bit of a, um, uh, exercise at the beginning. So uh, there's a cartoon that we actually um, uh, asked from one of the participants in the room uh, for uh, providing that background grayish cartoon. So, I mean, the quiz for you guys is that uh, who is that person who draw that, who draw that cartoon? Okay, well, this is actual credit. We can uh, revisit this uh, toward the end of this workshop. <laughs> and you can ask around, there are gonna be rumors about it. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, so blocking workshop is about blocking and extreme events in a warming climate. And um, to show you the importance of this topic, shortly before this blocking workshop, there was a block. So uh, for those of you who are, um, who are familiar with uh, the NCAR, um, you know, uh, closure due to the winter storm, um, you're probably aware that there was a big, um, it was a big snow uh, last Thursday and Friday. And uh, if you look into the um, 500 hectopascal geopotential height, it was very clearly a blocking pattern. And um, so hopefully we will be motivated by this sort of uh, real time extreme events uh, and throughout this workshop. So let me uh, introduce our um, uh, scientific organizing committee and I, I like to invite all of you to stand up so that uh, folks can see them and if you have any question or any uh, comments or thoughts, please feel free to uh, just talk to them. So we have um, uh, Jian here, <laughs> um, uh, Melissa, Um, Gong, uh, Stephanie, uh, V, <laughs> yeah. uh, Ayla, Kim. Great. Well, let's applaud for all those um, people's hard work and. So also want to thank for the um, uh, U.S. Clever um, staff member, so Alisa, uh, who is really behind the scene doing all the heavy lifting. Thank you, Alisa, and also. <laughs> also Mike, who is really, you know, in charge of the whole thing as our boss, um, and also Jessica. I uh, want to also thank our uh, sponsors uh, from NOAA MAP and uh, NSF Large Scale uh, Circulation Dynamics Group uh, and also DOE, um, RTMA. So um, I want to quickly go over our participant uh, break, uh, breakdown. Um, and this is a very sizable group for a um, specific topic of interest of both weather and climate community. Um, so we have about uh, 80 plus people here in the room, and I'm glad that we have a relatively smaller room so that we have more, uh, we're, we're, we're forced to have more interaction. So, <laughs> because what happened when you have a big room is that uh, the first two rows is gonna be empty and uh, folks are gonna be all staying around um, in the back. And, uh, but here we're in force to have a more uh, close interaction, which is great, all right? <laughs> Um, and the, the thing that I'm really, really happy and really proud is that this workshop has uh, more than 57% of the participants are early career scientists, uh, including students, uh, junior faculty, uh, postdocs. And this is, uh, to my knowledge, the largest percentage of early career scientists in, a few, in the past few years and perhaps the past decade. And uh, so what this means is that, you know, the workshop is not just forward-looking in terms of the science, but also 
uh, forward looking in terms of the people and, uh, you know, uh, all of you are sitting there are the people who are, you know, um, going to be the leader for the next 10 years or so. So I'm happy to um, have more of a um, younger group of people discussion and uh, I, I want to encourage in, uh, all of you in the breakout room discussion to um, for the leaders who are more senior to invite every single one to speak up, uh, especially for the, you know, beginning students and uh, uh, junior folks. And we also have um, a large number of uh, different countries coming to here, and uh, I'm sure uh, during today's events throughout the day, you will talk to each other and uh, know their, uh, each other's background. And um, it's really international in, in many sense. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the things that I'm eager to learn because um, different backgrounds, different people have different way of thinking, uh, different style of, uh, you know, doing research on weather and climate and blocking. So this is going to be a, a melting pot for all school of thinkings. All right. So we have the motivation uh, on understanding the fundamental dynamics of blocking. But what that means is that uh, if we do have a breakthrough of that, then um, we're following, facing several gap of knowledge, uh, including gap, uh, a lack of predictive uh, theory and model bias. Um, and also there is a recent essay on weather and climate um, uh, schism and also the burst of the blocking forecast. So I will um, hand this uh, to, to our other co-chair, Jian, for continuing the discussion. So first of all, welcome everyone for you know, a vibrant uh, workshop uh, in three days. You know. And uh, so uh, for the uh, objective, we have identified some kind of uh, gaps, but uh, you no. Know, Hopefully, by the end of the uh, workshop, we will provide some solution. That's the hope. That's the kind of a paraphrase this uh, workshop objective. And uh, since no, we don't have a lot of time, we want to start our session on time at 8.45. So I'll quickly walk you through the, uh, the agenda and what we expect in the coming three days and also some logistics. I hope everybody already checked out the, uh, the agenda. So yeah, for these three days, we will have uh, uh, six sessions, most uh, oral primary sessions, and also a two poster session, and uh, three in-person breakout sessions, and uh, two extra virtual sessions for European online participants. And uh, so for this workshop, we are going to do things slightly differently. For each oral session, uh, we probably you know uh, because this is a really big room, and uh, to make you know things proceed smoothly, we want uh, you know, let the four speakers to finish their talk first with a minimum minimum interruption, and then we invite all the speakers uh, on the stage, and we have a kind of a panel style Q and A for roughly half an hour, and uh, so. Each I think for each day, the two hour sessions also be followed by a. A breakout session. Uh, uh, for in-person participants, we're going to have uh, four groups. There's some upstairs, some probably you know, across the hall. You know, we, we will figure out where, where the you know, breakout sessions are. And uh, so mainly for three days for in-person participants, we're going to cover mainly three topics. First is you know, the, the you know, key ingredients of atmospheric blocking and its connection to weather and climate extremes. On the second day, we're going to talk about you know, how to understand blocking either using theory or models. And the third day is about projection, that how climate change would influence blocking. And uh, for the uh, uh, virtual breakout, for European online participants, we will only, because of the time difference, we'll only have a two uh, virtual breakout session. So it's in their local, um, early afternoon time, our early morning, around seven, six-ish. And, but all the breakout session will report out, uh, read out uh, first thing in the morning at the recap. Um, slightly different time. Uh, tomorrow morning will be 8.15. 8 On Wednesday will be 8 o'clock. And uh, now we're going to, you know, 
probably lacked one person to represent their breakout group to give a very quick three minute summary and uh, for all the turnout six session, probably no more than three minutes, two and a half minutes, It'll be very quick. And uh, uh, workshop philosophy, I guess given this you know, diverse backgrounds of the participants, I guess the, the overall philosophy is to encourage participation. And we want to hear different perspective, you know, no matter your modelers or you know, the theoreticians or you know, weather forecasters. And uh, especially we encourage you know, the uh, uh, new generation scientists, students and early career scientists to speak out either during Q&A or the breakout session. And you know, please remember, you know, for young people, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Okay, all questions are good questions. And uh, let's see, three more minutes, okay. Uh, so since this year is also election year in the US, so we also want everyone to have a exercise your voting right. And uh, we have this small exercise you know, for everyone to vote for those blockings. We put out uh, four you know, blockish features uh, on the poster. Uh, I'm not sure, Alisa, where the poster will be? Oops. Uh, outside or out, upstairs? Oh, it's just outside, yeah. So please cast your vote there. And uh, so the result will be yeah, shared on Wednesday by the end of the, will be the workshop. And some, some notes for this uh, you know, hybrid format of the workshop. Uh, for in-person participants, uh, so when you ask question, please speak to the, uh, the Mac there. We have two Macs. Um, no two aisles and uh and so please also state your name before asking the question so that we can keep the record and uh, for the virtual participants and um, please use the raise hand feature and and uh, when caught on just unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you can okay and uh, by the way another thing is you know, all the posters both in person and virtual posters will be viewed uh, available online so you can access all the poster gallery uh, on the workshop website and uh, so a couple of more logistics uh, i think the bathroom is in the room of 2615 is that right and uh, for a wi-fi um, the wi-fi name is ucar visitor no passwords needed and also we're going to have a, a group photo today, I think, before a second break, that is uh, 3.15 p.m. And uh, another good news is no. And so all breakfast and lunch will be provided during the three days. So this morning we only have a cold breakfast, but uh, this will be made up at 10.30 during our first break. So I have another second breakfast. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, it's more than I. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, yeah, for for breakout session, uh, at this moment we don't know which group we will be assigned to, but we will know uh, by lunch time. I think Alisa will going to post the breakout assignments for everyone. So the yeah, this assignment can can vary, you know, from yeah from session to session. So it's just to mingle people together to get a maximum exposure, you know, to different, you know, background people. And uh, let's see. Uh, I hope this is a, uh, yeah, another quick thing. So if you have a question about this building, like where's the bathroom, so on and so forth, the meals, please ask Jessica. If you have any question about the workshop itself, logistics, scheduling, please, please ask Alisa and Mike. And uh, so last thing, uh, there's an informal uh, hike, sunset, sunset hike uh, in the evening of uh, Tuesday. So it's, you know, it's voluntary based. And uh, so if you're interested, please sign up. Uh, or you contact to Ka Ying. Uh, so could you raise your hand? I <laughs> see. Okay. Yeah. You can email her and uh, the email is here. And also you could use the QR code to sign up for the uh, yeah, afternoon hike. I think with that, 
I think I'll stop and uh, let's um, begin. So I think, uh, first of all, that was a really great talk. Thank you, Dr. Olivia. What'd you all think? Did you enjoy it? All right, so we're gonna keep the good times going. Next, uh, we'll save the questions for the end. So Dr. Olivia, please don't leave. Um, so next we have a really great presenter. It's a student from Purdue University. Her name is Valentina Castaneda, and she'll be talking about storm swap, a key region for concurrent blocking and heat wave events with quasi stationary Rosby waves amplification. Please Valentina. Hello everyone, I'm Valentina. I'm a second year PhD student working with Professor Lei Wang at Purdue University. So by the way, I know who is the artist of the cartoon, but I can't tell you. Um, and before starting, I wanted to express, well, I'm Colombian, and I wanted to express how fortunate I feel to be a Colombian woman in science. And yeah, that every time that I go to a conference or to a workshop, I feel very privileged and very happy to be sharing and learning science with you. <laughs> okay, my presentation is titled um, Storm Swamp, a key region for concurrent blocking and heat wave events with quasi stationary Raspberry wave amplification. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so we know that during summertime, a potential cause of increased blocks and weather extreme is the amplification of atmospheric planetary waves. So for example, here we can see this figure from Wolf et al. 2018 in which they show a connection between anomalous Rodby wave amplitudes and extreme temperature anomalies, in this case over Europe. Um, for blocking also, it has been recognized in the literature that Rodby waves often amplify upstream of blocking anticyclones contributing to, to its persistence. Um, so in the figure in the bottom, Altenhoff et al. Uh, are using Hopmore diagrams of the meridional wind to show the evolution of Rossby waves prior and after blocking onsets over uh, North Atlantic and Pacific uh, blocking events. Now, before to continue, I want to explain you very quickly uh, the algorithm we are using for the detection. So for blocking events, we are following the methodology proposed by Martinu uh, 2017. So we consider at least five consecutive days of a strong local wave activity passing a threshold and with the maximum uh, point having a displacement uh, within five degrees of latitude and 10 degrees of longitude throughout the event. Now, uh, for heat waves, um, we are following Tang et al. 2013, and we are considering a heat wave event when at least five consecutive days have more than around 5% on uh, of the United States continental area with daily surface air temperature exceeding a threshold that varies um, both spatially and temporally. And also the center of these uh, regions uh, don't move faster than five latitude or longitude per day. So here, this result is from Mervatu. On the left, we can see with the red contours, the region with the highest intensity of the heat waves that is uh, the composites of the surface air temperature anomalies. Uh, during the events and the blue shading shows the frequency of blocking events that are preceding or concurring um, with the heat waves. So comparing uh, this distribution to the seasonal climatological frequency of blocking, the associated ones to heat waves in the United States have this particular location of over the West United States. Um, and if we want to know how is the propagation of uh, Rossby waves associated to these heat wave events, we can look at this homolic diagram that we constructed from um, extreme function anomalies with the horizontal line representing the onset of heat wave events and the vertical line, the center of United States heat waves. Um, so here, uh, 
Wave number five structure can be seen evolving prior and during the events. And this is a specific uh, pattern associated to heat waves agrees with literature like uh, Haiyan Teng 2013, in which they show the pattern, but from um, simulations like CAM simulation. Uh, so yeah, you can check this uh, result that we are plotting here in this paper that uh, was published last month. And yeah, you can you can read it, and we are uh, kind of showing um, the role of the climatological state in supporting these United States heat waves through Rossby wave packets. Now, since we want to learn more about this propagation, uh, for the next results, we use Rossby wave packet diagnosis. So, for the detection of the Rossby wave packet amplitude, we follow um, Seeming et al. 2003, in which they obtained the envelope uh, by getting the analytical signal of upper level meridional wind anomalies uh, along um, latitude circles. And now to see how fast the waves propagate, we follow Fracolodis 2019. So they basically calculate the local phase of this analytical signal to get the instantaneous um, local. Uh, local phase and to get the phase speed. And if we use the analytical, si uh, analytical signal of the envelope and instead of the B velocity, we can obtain the group velocity. So, um, yeah, this is the method uh, we are using. Uh, but additionally, we are using QGPV, uh, quasi stationary, uh, quasi geostrophic potential vorticity. Uh, just to have an idea of the waveguides for the propagation, because you know, Rossby waves uh, can be understood as um, tropopos level PV anomalies propagating along regions where we have strong PV gradients. Right. So let's look at the results. So here uh, we have um, the result for the Rossby wave packet envelope. On the left, we can see the climatological Rossby wave packet amplitude for the summertime. Uh, in the middle, we can see the mean of all 15 days prior to heat waves. And on the, um, on the right, we can see the difference between these two. So the regions in red in the right figure are representing the amplification of the Rossby wave packet preceding the events, right? But the question that we want to answer here is, um, what is the role of um, basic states provi provi providing favorable dynamical conditions for high amplitude on blocking and heat wave statistics? So we want to learn more, more. We want to describe more the basic states that are providing these favorable dynamical conditions, right? But how can we describe these basic states? So here we have the evolution of composites of the gradients of QGPV, uh, which in other words are the waveguides for the Rossby wave propagation. So we have the composites for 20 days ahead of the events, 15 days ahead, 10 days, five days, the first day of United States heat waves, and five days after uh, the events, right? So we can see that um, the QGPV get weaker when approaching to the onset of the events, especially of the over the Pacific and the Atlantic region. Um, so from here we can say that the basic states for heat waves and the basic states for non-heat waves days are different. At least in terms of uh, QGPV, we can say that. And as we want to look at the response of blocking and heat waves to these ba different basic states we will use modeling approach. So we use the dry dynamical core proposed by, by Helen Suarez, 1994. This model is idealized. It has no diurnal cycles, no seasonal cycles, no topography, and it completely isolates the dry dynamics. So we use uh, this version proposed by Chang uh, 2006 to use a simple temperature relaxation just to uh, simulate the realistic basic states from ERA5. Um, so specifically, we resemble two backgrounds, the perpetual heat wave and the perpetual non-heat wave from ERA5. And if we compare uh, the gradients 
of temperature between the experiments, we can see that the basic state for heat wave days has lower uh, temperature gradients consistent with the weaker PV gradients that we observe from reanalysis. Now, comparing uh, the mean envelope, the group velocity, and the phase speed between the both simulations, we can see that the perpetual known heat wave has very fast propagation compared to the other one. And well, this is not optimal for providing conditions for heat waves. And in fact, um, we couldn't detect events for these experiments. While for the perpetual heat wave, we found heat waves and associated blocking events with a configuration that resembles well the location of the observed ones. I, I say it that resemble well because well we are talking about the um, super idealized model, right? Now uh, let's focus on this perpetual heat wave experiment. Uh, here we have again um, the seasonal um, the seasonal mean of the rugby way packet diagnosis variables, but compared to the mean of all 15 days prior heat waves in the simulation. Also, we add stream function anomalies with the contours in this figure. So um, we can see that in this experiment, we can resemble that we see in reality prior to the events. So we can see the specific wave number five with the uh, blue contours. We can see amplification of the uh, Rossby waves with the envelope, and we can see lower um, phase speed and group velocity. Then, um, if we look at the evolution of the QG PV gradients, we can also see the weakening of the waveguides at the preferred locations. Specifically, this region approaching the blocking and heat wave region is what we describe as the swamp of the storm track, which is basically a lack of waveguide. And the consequence um, is that the reduction of the paces is that we have a reduction of the pace speed over the continental United States. You can uh, look at this reduction of phase speed with this Hopmolek diagram uh, with the horizontal line again as the first day of heat waves. And yeah, um, this idea behind the reduction of CP uh, of phase speed is consistent uh, with Nakamura uh, 2018 and Swanson uh, 2000. And yeah, that's it. And so to summarize, um, we show that the background state during heat wave days is characterized by weaker QG PV radians at preferred locations. That is a lack of waveguide at preferred locations. And this background act, acts as a waveguide for the Rodby wave packet propagation that is associated to heat waves and to the formation of the storm swamp, right? This storm swamp provides favorable dynamical conditions for blocking and heat waves because, ampli because it's associated to amplified probably wave packets and reduced um, phase speed. And another conclusion is that the dry dynamics are able to reproduce uh, the heat waves, blocking events, and the fundamental mechanism. And thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Valentina. Would you believe that only second year PhD student? Sounds like a pro up there. Um, so next we got Lance Bosart coming from the University of Albany. Thank you, Lance. All right, let's see if we can break the computer. All right, first to uh, um, introduce my co-authors, uh, Bruno Ribeiro, uh, postdoc, Tyler Light, uh, PhD student who's here as a poster, and Alex Mitchell back at Albany. All right, so this is um, an opportun to, opportunistic uh, look at that, uh, like I like to do, and just go and look at something, do the hell of it and see what happens. Um, looking at what happened in August uh, last summer, and, excuse me, in 2022 in Europe, or more likely Eurasia. So the motivation is very simple, record-breaking heat waves that plagued much of Western and Central Europe during June and July. Uh, an impressive U.S. style severe weather outbreak of serial derecho occurred over the southern Europe on 18, 19 August. And Eurasian trough in the Bay of Bengal depressions facilitated record breaking flooding in Pakistan in August of 2022. 
All right, the purpose to investigate to what extent the aforementioned extreme weather events can be understood from a subseasonal perspective. All right, let's look first at the heat wave in Western and Central Europe and through here. So this is a time series from the ECMWF and it shows if you look at the far right, that's 2022. So that was the hottest summer uh, up to that time on record. And you, the obvious change, a signal of climate changes in the time series is, is quite evident. Um, this is the blew me away, the daily high temperature record in, in, the, um, in the UK and through here. Um, I didn't think the temperature could get to over 40 C in the UK, but it sure did. Um, there, but you look at how far that is uh, above the, the the curve. That the 2022, almost every day, is above the median of the of the long time series that they are in the red. And if you look at a larger perspective, if you're over Eurasia and Africa, heat waves and fires scorch Europe, a Africa, and Asia. And there's just some of the numbers of some of the record temperatures in various places around in that region. So it was an extraordinarily hot summer. And Western Europe's hottest day was the 19th of July, 2022 of, of that summer, when you, the anomalies there in the parts of France and Germany, um, in the UK, uh, were approaching 15 and higher, 16, 17 degrees C in there. And if you look at like the typical on the, on the Europe's hottest day, if you look at the standardized on the left, 250 millibar wind speed anomalies and uh, standardized 500 millibar height anomalies on the right, Two things stand out immediately is the high amplitude of the flow, the pattern. So the ridges were really ridgy and the troughs were really troughy. Um, and in that standardized anomalies above three sigma there in the, in the uh, 500 millibar heights over Germany in there, but flanked by areas where it was considerably chillier in there. And if we look at, say, standardized precipitable water anomalies on the same day and 850 millibar standardized temperature anomalies, uh, you can see on the west side of the ridges, as been already demonstrated in the talks we've heard this morning so far, uh, the highest precipitable water anomalies are on the left side, western flank of the ridge there over the, over the UK. Then in over northern Germany on the right, there's a little area of six sigma, five to six sigma anomalies on the 850 millibar temperature. So over the ridge axis and then just downstream of the ridge axis, what, what Olivia uh, nicely showed uh, a little while ago, really extreme heat in there. All right. So one of the things that happened was a severe weather outbreak on the August of uh, 18th in there. Um, strong upper level forcing for ascent east of a prominent upper level trough, strong deep convection developed down shear of the above upper level trough, and strong surface wind gusts from convectively generated downdrafts. Now, this is not, this is something I've seen up close and personal on the Texas panhandle uh, once, but this is not something you typically see in Europe the mothership cloud, which means the end of the world is about to happen. And if you see this on the planes and you're storm chasing, you need to take cover immediately, but take pictures first. So that your survivors can see, can uh, say, this is what would happen. And there are the severe weather reports. I mean, this looks like an outbreak over the central plains. Uh, this is not supposed to happen in Europe at this time of the year, but I think we've seen a signal of climate change in this. Um, kind of thing. So a serial derangement lasted for 13 hours. A path lengths over uh, 800 kilometers, max wind speed 225 kilometers per hour. Even ha Howie Bluestein wouldn't throw this one back. This would be um, a keeper. Bulk shear of about 25 meters per second, cape over 1,500 joules per kilogram. On Corsica, um, there are some of the maximum wind speeds there on the island. It really got really whacked. Mediterranean sea surface temperatures were about three to five degrees C above normal. That have to help to increase the derecho intensity in there. And if you do like a back trajectory analysis from Corsica there on the left, and it's blown up there on the right, you can see the trajectories are coming from North Africa. Um, with surface based mixed layers over North Africa became elevated mixed layers after crossing the Mediterranean and getting into the into Corsica. In there, and if you look at uh, satellite sounding composite, I stole this slide from one of the, from one of the European Center uh, uh, discussions of this. And but just look at the locations A, B, C. There are, are shown on the Western uh, the Corsica is there, and the I don't have a cursor here. It's cursor um, in there. But look at just B in there. You look at the classic sounding in B there uh, for severe weather with a lot of Cape right to uh, uh, starting a, a positive area starting about 850 millibars and all the way up. But if you look at the shear. And just B, 24 meters per second, zero to six kilometer shear. Uh, mi mi mixed layer cape is 2719 joules per kilogram. And the storm relative helicity through zero to three kilometers 
322 meters squared per second squared. So this is impressive by US standards. So this was quite the event. And there's a bow evolution, echo evolution over Corsica at that time, about six hour apart on that. And the forward speed of this thing was 40 to 50 meters per second. So that's going to, that's a real issue for warnings, getting out watches and warnings when something's moving that fast. And in a place that's just not used to this kind of uh, action, um, that caused a lot of trouble. So what was the, um, what was the issue here in terms of the, uh, on the left there is the 850 millibar heights and through here Cape is shaded. And the red areas there over Corsica um, approaching 4,000 joules per kilogram of Cape. Okay, that's enough to get the US people ch uh, storm chasing 4,000 joules per cape. Yeah, we'll go out today and see what we'll see what might happen. But you can see on the right hand side there at 500 millibars, the blue areas of where there's ascent in there. But note how unusually deep trough that reaching down to northern Africa, which allowed the mix that was the trough was critical, the depth of that trough to get the elevated surface based mixed layers over the Mediterranean where they became elevated mixed layers when they were in Corsica and in Central Europe. And then that's on the 20th of August later, and the trough is lifting out to the right, lifting to the north. But now the next part of the story is gonna be the big block, blocking high that you see over Western Russia um, sitting down in there. So this trough was lifted out to the northeast, and then it weakened as it lifted out. But the impact of that was very important because um, the top two Hungarian meteorologists were fired after a blown convective storm forecast. They saw all that action upstream and said it was going to, uh oh, and it turned out this was a national holiday in Hungary. And so um, heads rolled um, in that case. And um, I couldn't resist a little snarky comment there about this certain individual who used a Sharpie pen to, uh, to modify a weather service forecast. Um, his, whose name shall not be mentioned in, in public. Um, all right, so now let's take a look at downstream from there. So here's the mean and anomaly 250 millibar heights from 16 to 28 August. On the left there is the block we were just, just pointed out to you that was downstream of that severe weather. Um, and there's an, also a nice, very strong ridge over the Tibetan Plateau, and, and then a relatively deep trough um, to the north of there, downstream of the block and to the north of the Tibetan Plateau Ridge. And the anomaly on the right-hand side is the anomaly. So you can see that a remarkably deep trough that's sitting to the north of, of, of China at that time, the time mean. So some of the key takeaway, takeaways for this part, severe weather outbreak was driven by an unusually intense progressive upper level trough. Saharan dry air and steep lapse rates support a convectively driven evaporately cooled downdrafts and downstream flow amplification across Eurasia facilitated massive Pakistan flooding, which we'll now focus here on the last part of the trough. I mean, this was just remarkable to me. I, I, these were older statistics. I'm sure they've been updated um, since, but the, the uh, worst floods since 10 to 2010, 10, 10 to 12% of the country flooded. I mean, these are just remarkable um, in there. And there's an example. Um, what do you do with, with that kind of thing? It's just a disaster. Um, in there, and it stretched from all the way across the red areas of severe, all the way from southern Pakistan, all the way, uh, all the way to North Pakistan. In there, so the, the widespread extent of the flooding was just remarkable. In there, but now let's take a look at some of the mean and anomaly precipitation, precipitable water. Um, if you look there over north in Pakistan in northwest India, there's a small little area in there which is about 70 millimeters of precipitable water. That's enough to take a bath while walking. Um, the precipitable water anomaly is over 20 millimeters in that area over Pakistan. This is over this period 16 to 18. So you had all this incredibly moisture, but where did all this come from? Well, if we look at the 700 millibar heights and integrated IVT, integrated water vapor transport during that period for the 24th of August, um, I mean, on August, for the 8th, on, uh, uh, we go, 8 and the 10th, it was, couldn't get rid of that. So, the gray areas represent uh, IV transports of over 1,200. Red is into the 1,000 uh, range. So you can see from the Arabian Sea uh, directed across India, um, there's the transport, but there's a nice cyclonic circulation in there. And so you've got a real deep moisture transport initially from the Arabian Sea. So if we go forward, um, well, it's not advancing here all of a sudden. There we go. So if we go to the 12th and the 14th, you can see the, there's a broad cyclonic circulation. 
But then you get a, on the left, right hand side there, you got a, a Bay of Bengal depression that moves westward. So these are the normal things that you associate with flooding in Pakistan and India, Bay of Bengal um, depressions moving westward. There's 16th and 18th of August in there. You can see uh, that one is moving westward across northern India. This is what you normally see when you have a very rainy period in India. And then the next one is like, you know, uh, will the next contestant please come on down and sign in? There comes the next, uh, next dis uh, disturbance from the uh, Bay of Bengal, and they move westward. But there's something else going on in through here. Note the strong northerly flow to the north of Pakistan on the east side of the blocking ridge that we talked about um, previously. That's going to be a very important role here in a minute as we go through the 24th of August. And by then, by the 26th of August, it, the, we stop with the Bay of Bengal depressions and the rain kind of comes to an end. All right, here's a sounding from New Delhi. I could not find uh, any soundings from Pakistan during this event. Um, they probably exist, but uh, I was just looking in the wrong places. But you can see the deep warm air advection that was present in the sounding there at New Delhi and the precipitable water was about 64 millimeters. So you have deep warm air advection, poleward of Bay of Bengal, uh, BOB is Bay of Bengal uh, tropical depressions. All right, now let's look a little bit upstream and see more of what's going on. Downstream of that ridge, you will note the trough north of India, downstream of that big blocking high that we've been talking about in there. And on the right-hand side are the most unstable Cape and Sin, and in the red areas there, you're over 35 to 4,000 joules per kilogram. And those are shears there, zero to six kilometer shear and vectors. So I would point out to you there on the right in that trough region, you've got uh, 4,000 joules per kilogram of cape sitting under 40 meters, uh, sitting under 40 uh, 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 shear there of 40 uh, meters per second. So uh, what is that going to do? Well, if you're on the U.S. Plains and you've got those kinds of Cape values and those kinds of shear values, you are on the right side of the chart. You're out the door heading for Kansas, whatever, and clicking your heels two times. Now, the other thing that's going to happen here is you're going to get a jet equator with jet entrance region is going to form north of India and Pakistan. This is extraordinarily unusual. This is um, uh, two days later on the 24th of August in through here. Um, note that the trough is elongated north of India and the high moisture content and shear is sitting associated with that trough. And here's the time mean in there, mean anomaly, 500 millibar heights. And notice the strong uh, trough downstream of that blocking ridge uh, over uh, West, Eastern Europe. And you've got, um, you've got the situation where you're going to develop an equator with jet entrance region. There it is. That's the time mean, 250 mean left and anomaly right. 250 millibar winds for 12th to 26th of August in there. So you have an equator with jet entrance region over northern India. I can't emphasize how rare it is to have this kind of strong jet. This was the bonus added extra in addition to the Bay of Bengal cyclones that allowed for the incredible rainfall at, in Pakistan. Equator with jet entrance regions work their wonderful dynamics no matter where you are on the globe. And you can see that in through here, we'll just look at some time, this is the left-hand side is the standardized anomalies of 250 millibar winds and standardized anomalies of 500 millibar heights are on the right-hand side. Watch the trough swing down towards northern India. Two days later, see the trough is extending downward and the red area then represents where the wind speed anomalies are uh, over two and a half to three sigma. Go back forward two more days and look at that jet entrance region sitting right there to the north of Pakistan downstream of the blocking ridges. Ridges cause trouble, though these big, huge blocking ridges are major league uh, contributors in there. And why is that important? How to making the jet? The arrows here, this represents negative PV advection by the irrotational wind at 200, over the 200, 300, 200 millibar layer. The pink area represents wind speeds of over 60 meters per second. A 60 meter per second jet north of India, that just does not happen. At this time of, at this time of the year but so outflow those arrows represent outflow from all the convective heating going on over in india and pakistan associated with the rain that negative pv advection by the irrotational wind is what is strengthening the jet so yes the bay of bengal disturbances are very important for providing the moisture but the bonus added extra here is associated with negative pv advection by the irrotational wind which drove this highly anomalous jet 
So these are some testable hypotheses. The evolution of the large scale flow pattern favored an anomalously strong jet stream to the north of the Tibetan Plateau. Negative potential vorticity advection by the irritational wind due to deep convection over Pakistan and India further strengthened this jet stream. Rainfall was especially heavy and persistent in the equatorward red entrance region of the aforementioned jet stream. A little quick summary. Intense Mediterranean trough was a catalyst for severe weather and downstream flow amplification across Eurasia. The, the era of when we used to do synoptic analysis, we put a box around the event and look at it on, on time scales of two, three, four days. And, and it, it's not going to work on S2S. Everything moves across the boundary. So it, it's a whole different business model and looking at for synoptic meteorology. Um, Central Asia trough facilitated moisture transport from the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea toward India and Pakistan, and heavy rainfall in Pakistan can be linked to equator with jet entrance region dynamics, extraordinarily rare for August. Now, concluding comment, this is an excerpt from Randall and Emanuel on the weather climate schism, a paper that's just out, I think it's very important. Um, this quote is very critical. The atmosphere science community includes both weather and climate scientists. These two groups interact much less than they should, particularly in the United States. The schism is widespread and has persisted for 50 years or more. It is found in academic departments, including mine, uh, laboratories, professional societies, and even funding agencies. Mending this schism would promote better, faster science. We sketch the history of the schism and suggest ways to make our community whole. So finally, what would Ed Lorenz think about continuing schism between weather and climate researchers? I postulate that he would agree with Randall and Emanuel. Why? Here's this weather map. No random date. Hand analysis, it's an A-plus analysis, dated on the 15th of April, 1996. Who did the analysis? Look down on the lower right there. Signed it, Ed Lorenz. Think about that. Ed Lorenz did a hand analysis just for the heck of it at a conference at the European Center of all places. I thank Jim Doyle for, he took, he saw what Ed was working on. He was at the meeting. He said, he grabbed it after the meeting was over. This is historical analysis. Forgot all about it. And 20 years ago, and about, about 2016, he remembered, and he said, we were at a conference. He says, I think I have a hand analysis that Ed Lorenz, he, he found it. Uh, he sent it to me. I sent it to Carrie Emanuel. Within five minutes, I got a response back from Carrie Emanuel that he was posting it on, on the wall at the Lorenz Center at, at uh, MIT. And that just goes to show you that weather informed Ed Lorenz's science. No question in my mind that his predictability, interest in predictability, was informed by weather. Remember, he was a weather forecaster in the in, station in Greenland during World War II. So he obviously knew about the, the, the impacts of prediction. And as, as when I, he looked at the weather maps almost every day. And so his, the weather maps on the old fashioned map walls at MIT were right out of my grad student office. And so when Ed Lorenz wanted to talk about the weather maps, I was, whatever, didn't matter what I was doing, I was gonna talk about the weather maps with Ed. Weather informed his science. Most people don't realize that, that Ed, Ed Lorenz was a bomb fan. And I'm sure if I could go back and ask him how, how he got his ideas for predictability and recognizing it when the diversion of solutions. His experience on weather forecasting did it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, another great talk. Thank you, Dr. Lance. Um, so next, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. We got Hilla Afargan Gersman. Is that okay? Is someone okay? Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, um, I'm happy to be here in Boulder in the blocking workshop. Usually I go to Stormtrek uh, workshops, but uh, it's nice uh, to change. Um, so today I want to talk about trends in extreme cold outbreaks uh, in a changing climate and a bit about the role of blocking. Um, this work is done, uh, was done in ETH in Zurich and also uh, I'm affiliated with the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, it was done in collaboration with my colleagues, Emanuele Russo, colleagues from ETH, Emanuele Russo, Dominic Puller, uh, Jacopo Riboldi, and Daniela de Mason. And a bit, few more people. Um, okay. So, um, globally averaged air temperatures is projected to uh, continue to increase uh, during the 21st century. However, um, 
The projected changes in temperature distributions can have various consequences for cold temperature extremes. Uh, I took this classic, do I have a marker, I guess? Okay. Okay, <laughs> I'll just try not to use it, I guess. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I took this, oh. No, that. Okay, I took this figure uh, uh, from a classic, uh, um, um, you can see something similar in a classic IPCC report. Uh, I took it from Codera and Gugan uh, from 2014, and you can see that changes in the distribution of temperatures can uh, uh, affect the, uh, uh, the frequency of cold extremes, but uh, in various ways. You can see that it can a, a change and a lead to less extreme cold temperatures. It can change to a more extreme cold temperatures, depending on how the distribution changes. And also, if you have change symmetry, maybe there will be no change in the cold uh, temperature extremes. And But while we already know that there is a general decrease in the frequency of cold temperature extremes, and I will show it later, certain weather patterns are associated with increased colder outbreaks. Uh, we showed this, for example, for the uh, for the North Atlantic after sudden stratospheric warming events. And what you see here is the frequency of, sorry, I need my marker. Ah, yeah, okay. What you see here is the changes in marine colder outbreaks. So this is when you have a cold air over a warm ocean. And what you see that after SSW events, there are more colder outbreaks here over the Norwegian Sea and over the Barents Sea. Uh, however, after a, 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 these SSWs, you also get a decrease in the frequency of colder outbreaks over the Labrador Sea. So we do have a lot of special variability, especially in the North Atlantic. And going forward, okay. And this is from a nice uh, bachelor thesis, actually, uh, of Judith Gregelson from the uh, Karlsruhe uh, Institute of Technology. And what you see here is the, how the uh, frequency of two meter temperature extremes, so below the second percentile, changes for different weather regimes. And what you see that in the North, uh, uh, Eastern North Atlantic, cold temperature extremes are associated with blocked weather regimes, and particularly the Greenland blocking, as you see here in the lower panel. So a Greenland blocking is associated with up to five times a, a, a more frequent cold extremes in, uh, over Europe. But uh, other blocked regimes, as you can see in the two upper maps here, ah, okay. <laughs> So other blocked regimes are associated actually with the decrease in uh, like European blocking or Scandinavian blocking would be associated with suppression of cold temperature extremes. So it really matters what kind of blocking do you have and where exactly it is located uh, to see the effect of the cold temperature extremes in this sector. Uh, and we are interested, I forgot to mention it earlier. So what we are interested in, this is in my first slide, sorry, is to understand what are the recent changes, the recent trends in cold temperature extremes, and how these changes in, in the trends of temperature extremes are related to the atmospheric circulation. So let's go. To do that, we defined a, what are cold waves. So we focus on cold waves. These are periods of daily mean a, a near surface air temperatures, or two, two meter temperatures, that is below a, a certain threshold for three consecutive days. And our threshold for a given day we define the threshold uh, as the 10th percentile for a reference period between 1981 and 2010. And uh, uh, this threshold is defined as the 10th percentile of the daily mean temperatures on a running window. So this will be between minus 15 days before this, this day and 15 days after. So using this definition, we can define these cold waves. And of course, they have the uh, persistent uh, uh, of three consecutive days. And we use ERA uh, 5 reanalysis, and we analyze the period between 1940 and 2023. And, and here you can see, for example, the trend. It's a global trend. Um, in the rest of the talk, I will focus on the North Atlantic. But first, maybe we should look at the, at the global trend uh, in the number of cold wave days between 1940 and 2023. And what you see very clearly that the trend is mostly uh, negative. You can see that uh, uh, throughout the globe, we get a, a generally negative uh, trend in the cold waves. However, especially in mid latitudes, uh, in my opinion, you can see that there is a no trend. Uh, you can see these white regions that are associated more with, uh, 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 especially here you can see in the North Atlantic. Ah. <laughs> Okay, that's hard. In <laughs> the North Atlantic, you can see that uh, uh, there is a no trend region. And uh, the trend is defined here as the number of days per year that are linked to a cold wave. And a um, few details about the calculation of the trend, we did it using a non-parametric approach. 
uh, uh, because we are dealing with uh, extremes. So uh, here I focus more on the North Atlantic and I look at the cycle, it's called wave frequency. And what we see is that, again, generally a decrease in the frequency of cold waves in high latitudes, mostly over the Norwegian Sea, over the Greenland Sea too, and over the Labrador Sea right here. I don't know. So high latitudes would have the strongest increase. Uh, and this is, I uh, forgot to say, I'm sorry, this is a difference uh, between these two periods. So, the late period would be uh, from 1982 to uh, 2022, and the earlier period would be from 1941 to 1981. And very clearly you see that in the North Atlantic, there is this North Atlantic, it's a known phenomenon, it's a North Atlantic uh, warming hole, but it's clear when you look at the differences between these two uh, uh, periods, and as well as when you look at the trend. And, we find the same, a similar pattern when we look at the total number of cold waves. So it doesn't, uh, it seems to be robust for different definitions of, of cold days or cold days frequency. Uh, and I want to focus now uh, a bit more generally about uh, on these two regions. So one will be the, the, exactly above the North Atlantic uh, warming hole or cold blob. And the second region is over south, southwestern Europe. So the question we were asking ourselves, what uh, what will be the atmospheric conditions for cold waves over exactly over the North Atlantic cold blob? blob? And what you see is that for cold waves, so these are, this is, these are composites only for days that had a, a cold waves over this region, a, defined above a certain threshold. So it's above when the, the frequency of cold wave over this region would exceed the 90th percentile. And what we see is that cold waves over the North Atlantic would be associated with a, a zonal wind increase. So you can see here a change in the zonal wind that's becoming more uh, um, um, intense in mid latitudes. This is the uh, upper tropospheric wind at 300 millibars. When you look for these composites, when you look at the Z500 anomaly, you can see that there is a, a, a trough over the North Atlantic. And I looked also at the blocking frequency anomaly and the extratropical cyclone frequency. So of course, you see that in order to have cold waves uh, over the North Atlantic, Atlantic cold blob, you would have to have a, a decrease actually in the blocking frequency and an increase in the storm track. So there are more extratropical cyclones. Oh, again, no cursor. <laughs> Just give it up. Yeah, sure. Okay. You can see again that you will have more cyclones here <laughs> over the North Atlantic. However, if you, if you look at cold waves over a different region, if you look over southwestern uh, of Europe, especially we're interested in Spain because Spain is a hotspot for uh, uh, hot extremes. So we wanted to see what needs to happen in order to have cold waves over Spain. And what we see that we need, uh, uh, it kind of makes sense, of course. So it, we need a more uh, uh, southward uh, shifted jet. These are anomalies from climatology. We would need uh, actually an increased uh, um, um, ridge of south of uh, Greenland and a cyclonic or let's say negative anomalies of geopotential uh, over Spain. Uh, we see that we uh, it will be associated, these cold waves over Spain will be associated with the blocking frequency that increased uh, uh, in the North Atlantic and actually a reduction in the cyclone frequency because of the blocking. So there will be less, oh sorry less cyclones that go through this region and an increase in the exotropical cyclone frequency over uh, South uh, Western Europe. So let's see what's happening in the, to the changes. So going back to the uh, differences between the two periods, between the 1940s to 81 and 1982 to till present day. And what we see that for the Euro-Atlantic sector, there, are, there is a change. So definitely there is a decrease in the frequency of cold waves over here, sorry. Definitely, there is a decrease in the frequency of cold waves over the uh, entire sector. However, the, the distributions kind of overlap. If you go over the North Atlantic cold blob, you see that changes are much, much less robust there. The, the, there's still an overlap between the two periods, but over Spain and over southwestern Europe, definitely there is a change, a, a strong decrease in the cold frequency of cold wa waves. So. Going back to the trends again, uh, what are the changes in the atmospheric circulation to Z500 and to the jet stream that are associated, uh, uh, that we have today? So it's a difference between, again, between 1940s and present day. And what we see is that today we would have much stronger, uh, 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 um, let's say, an increase in the geopotential 
height anomalies, uh, sorry, not anomalies, so this is the geopotential height uh, uh, between uh, these two periods, and you see that actually would have a more zonal uh, pattern over Europe associated with the reduction of the geopotential uh, south of Greenland and an increase over central North Atlantic. Going to the jet stream, we see that today we have a more uh, uh, intensified jet stream. Uh, this is in the lower troposphere. Uh, over mid latitudes, the black contours show you the climatology. So you see that we have a more intense uh, jet stream that actually extends more towards Europe when we look at the differences between these, these two periods. Um, I was trying to think if this projects how if this projects to the NAO. So I looked at uh, Nouradin Omrani's paper here, and here you can see the multi decadal variations in the North Atlantic. and. Now we are actually, this is for the NAO and the left, the right panel is from the NAO and the left panel is for the um, Atlantic multi-decadal multi variability. So this is for SST in the Atlantic. And we see that we are now switching from a more, let's go here. We are now switching actually we, uh, uh, from a positive into a negative phase of the North Atlantic. So it is kind of consistent, but still for us, we, from the maps that we see, I see here, I would expect a much more uh, southward uh, shifted jet, but uh, it's actually more uh, uh, enhanced in the center of the of the jet. Looking at the weather regime, so going back to the uh, the same weather regimes that were used in the bachelor thesis that I showed you before, you can see that the weather regimes are actually so. This is uh, each color is for a different weather regime, uh, and I have to say for the weather regimes, I didn't analyze the, the period from the 1940s. So this is just from uh, 1980. So we took the last 20 years and compared it to the previous 20 years. And what you see, I specifically was interested in the Greenland blocking, so it's here. Because I'm expecting to see a, a decrease in Greenland blocking, but in the last 20 years, actually, there's a slight increase in the Greenland blocking. However, this would not be significant. We tried to check in different ways the significance of that. So, so there is an issue, but when you look at trends, if you do it only for the recent Okay, if you do it only for the last 20 years and compare it to the 20 years before, sometimes what you get is just variability. And I think that the fact that we take, you can see in the blue, uh, in the box, I marked the region that we took for the trend analysis. So when you take a larger period, then things start to be more statistically significant. But um, so I take this as a very, very cautious, uh, I mean, I'm not sure I even... Uh, sure about it myself, but I thought it's good to show for discussion since this, this is a, a workshop, I think. And so just to summarize the things that we've seen. So generally, uh, changes in extreme cold waves over the Euro Atlantic region show a pronounced decrease in both the frequency and the total number of extremely cold days. Uh, it didn't matter much what variable we tested because we took, we took some others. Uh, we see this trend right of a generally warm, uh, less, sorry, less colder outbreaks uh, globally, but some regions uh, don't have a clear trend. Definitely, I don't see an increase in cold waves anywhere. So you see that it's here, mostly red and white. So uh, if we try to understand what causes uh, cold waves in the North Atlantic, then an increase in the number of cold days in the North Atlantic would be associated with stronger upper tropospheric jet stream and anomalous trough. And in southwestern of Europe, an increase in the number of cold waves is related to a weaker jet in mid latitudes and a more pronounced Greenland blocking. And the last thing is going back to the differences between the 1940s and uh, today, we see that this decrease in the number of cold days uh, will be as or cold waves would be associated with actually a more zonal jet pattern uh, uh, in the lower troposphere. So. And that's it. And there's a lot of open questions uh, that uh, we still like to understand. So is the trend similar across mid latitudes? You kind of see it in this figure, but try to understand uh, the different regional setting. Also, same for the southern hemisphere. Also, is the trend changing? How does it uh, change? Is it, near, you know, is it staying near constant in time? Um, and also, how much of this change is due to the fact that we have a, a warmer temperature? So we get going back here. You can see it very nicely here. So how much of this trend, sorry, how much of this trend is because the entire uh, distribution is shifted towards warmer temperatures? So we would like to understand that too. Sorry. A little bit. Thank you. Okay. At this point, we'd like to ask all the speakers to come up to the stage for Q&A. Please. 
while they're coming up. Um, for the people online, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. We're going to go back and forth between in person and online. And then also, how was it? What did you all think about the first session? Is it good? Did you learn some stuff or what? I see a lot of heads nodding. Good. You awake? We have some more energy in here. Come on. <laughs> all right. Great. So our panelists are just about up here. We're missing one person, though, aren't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Online. Okay, cool. So um, maybe we'll start with a question in the room. So please raise your hand, walk up to the mic uh, right here, Prasad. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Prasad. Uh, I'm from uh, Victoria University in New Zealand. So my question, uh, first of all, is for Dr. Uh, Olivia. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I was just uh, interested about, uh, you said that uh, in the eastern half of the blocking anticyclone, we usually uh, expect that there should be clear, uh, clear sky, uh, sky conditions, which should uh, produce like, you know, drier conditions over the surface. So I was just curious about uh, whether, uh, do we expect uh, the heat extremes during summer or the possibilities of compound extremes would be more in such conditions to the eastern half of the blocking anticyclones? Um, you're asking whether the temperatures extreme, the temperature extremes are more pronounced, positive temperature extremes are more pronounced in the eastern part compared to the western part. Um, it is, I, I wouldn't say it, um, I wouldn't fully support this because um, it depends on whether advection or um, adiabatic warming is, is more relevant locally for the temperature anomalies. If it's, a, it, uh, if it's advection, then the advection would be most pronounced along the western flank. And if it's the, the adiabatic warming, then this is more pronounced in the center and in the east of the block. Okay. Yeah, just a just a no question. Uh, uh, you showed the February uh, 2012 uh, case in which we saw the positive uh, surface temperature anomaly over the northern flank of the blocking. So we're just curious about what could be the reason for that. Thank you. Um, yes. So that that can be. Um, you know, you have the deviation of the storm tracks um, around the blocks. So it could be that in that case, if uh, this this would be in winter, so you wouldn't, the advection would probably be more relevant for to bring warmer temperatures into this far northern location. So if the, if the blocks are leading to a deviation of the storm tracks towards the north of the block, you could have some um, advection of milder air from the west into that region. Thank you. We have uh, a virtual question from Volkmar Worth. So uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, I have a question for Valentina. Can you hear me? So we can hear uh, you. You, okay, fine. So the question refers to the the, the background state and the waveguide, the, the back, back background state that is a waveguide, um, and I'm perfectly happy with with your approach to diagnose that through a PV gradient. That's fine. I, maybe I missed it. Maybe you have told us um, how did you actually um, how did you compute your background state? Was it a temporal average, or how did you get that? Your, your mic is not on. You got to put your finger on the button. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so we took the background state for the heat waves, actually considering the most extreme ones. Uh, and the other background state, uh, we took the um, non heat wave days, but actually excluding the days preceding the heat wave days. Does it have sense to you? Right, but I mean, how do you then 
I mean, is it like a temporal average or something like a climatological average? Yes, it, comp- it ah. is. Okay, all right. So my, my question then is, I mean, if you have a t- temporal average, I mean, doesn't the, the the blocking itself kind of foreshadow a little bit the the lag in wave waveguide ability? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think our approach is trying to show like the importance of the dry dynamics for the events, and yeah, I think this background can be shaped. Is that a word? shape it yes. by um, the occurrence of the events and other uh, dynamical things I- involved. But we are just taking the temporal mean just to show or just to state the importance of the dry dynamics behind it. Actually, our next step is trying to find um, the causes or the forcing that are shaping these background states more specifically. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, John Lu, you wanna ask a question? Uh, I have a question for Lance. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for the fascinating depiction of this 2022 extreme you know, sequence of events. And uh, just wondering how the, uh, you know, the Blocking causing heat wave over Europe linked to the uh, flooding of you know, over Pakistan due to you know, tropical convection, uh, de- tropical depression. Uh, dynamically, how those two are linked? They're you know, far away from each other. Just curious. Let's see. Okay. The big ridge over Eastern Europe and the western part of the Soviet Union that was very persistent. Downstream of that, on the east side of that, there was northerly flow. So you brought in air, modified polar air um, from the Arctic onto the north side of the Tibetan Plateau. Um, so that basically across the Tibetan Plateau and across northern Pakistan, you had a highly anomalous meridional temperature gradient, which then fed the strong jet stream because you just don't see a westerly jet stream in that part of the area. So what in fact happened in equator jet entrance regions are really important for areas of ascent. And if you then put one of those over high precipitable water areas, it's going to rain and rain um, in there. So, yeah, the Bay of Bengal depressions did their thing like they always do every summer, but this was the bonus added extra that in effect turned an, uh, the normal rainy season into an extraordinary rainy season in August in, in Pakistan. Great. Thanks. Thank you. I have another virtual question from Stefan uh, Fau. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks for the presentations. Um, I have another question on the linkage between blocking and heat waves on the first two talks, actually. So from Olivia, we learned that typically heat waves and blockings, they co-occur, they occur at the same location. And then in the second talk, um, Valentino showed us that over the US, um, the blocking anomaly was quite uh, upstream of where the heat waves occurred. So I think there's some inconsistency there. And my suspicion is that this inconsistency is due to the definition of blocking. So you use quite different blocking indices to define your blocks. And then maybe it's more a comment as a, than a question, I don't know. But maybe the question then is in a more general uh, sense, is it really wise from us as a community to call these different things all with the same name to call them all blocking, although they are so different with weather systems and it depends so much on the definition. Um, maybe that's something to think about during the workshop, but maybe you can also comment on this directly. If you like. That's a really good question and we make sure you vote. Is this a block? That's, that's, that's really good. Uh, I guess maybe Dr. Olivia, if you want to start us off. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Stefan. This is a, a really important um, point. And I think it's even within Europe, the shapes of the, yeah, I, I say in quotation mark, the blocking systems that are linked to heat waves are different for heat waves over southern Europe, where they're more rich like 
compare it to over Northern Europe. And I, I think you're making a, a very important point that um, the, the different definitions imply also different dynamical forcing conditions and we should be um, very clear yeah, how we define the blocks that, that we use for the, for, we study the links to the surface extremes. Plus, I, I think there's also the, uh, the, the local geographical situation can also be important as well. So the, the relative position to the ocean, the effect of orography modulates this relationship between blocks and, and surface extremes. And it's important to, me, to keep that in mind as well. Valentina, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, to say that, yeah, we, I think we were showing different blocking events, but I just wanted to point out that same for heat waves. I think we have so many uh, methods to detect heat waves and we can get different kind of statistics, structure as well with the different definitions. So I think it's a good question. Thank you. Um, do we have a question for Hilla? Um, I, how about you first? And if you have a question, if you can go to the mic, please, just so we can all hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hilla, I think you brought up a very good question about the contribution of dynamics and the thermal dynamics near the end of your talk. Um, I was wondering how you would define the like the dynamic processes and the thermal dynamic processes. I can see they like closely linked to each other, say through like a temperature gradient. Also, uh, I was also wondering like if this is really the trend of cold waves, is uh, that does it uh, depend on like the definition of your cold waves? Say if you use a fixed like threshold. Uh, you would we would certainly see like a, a negative trend due to the increase of the mean temperature. But if we define the like the threshold based on the time varying climate mean, consider like the changes of the temperature statistics, I think we should have like a, a weaker trend, and that may imply like a weaker impacts from the thermodynamics. I would like to hear your thoughts on these two points. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, the way we are thinking to do it, uh, it's not that simple. So we're thinking to first to see, uh, look at the temperature reduction and see uh, uh, what part uh, is coming for, to see trends in temperature reduction, see if it's related to the coming from the temperature or coming from the, uh, um, from for example, from the meridional component. But uh, and more than that, we are thinking to look. It, yeah, it's a complicated, we're like, we're stuck a bit about that because we want to understand if it's about the trends, for example, uh, removing uh, or regressing out climate change, for example, and then um, uh, trying again to look at the detection of these cold waves and see if they behave the same if we remove um, the trend due to the climate change. So if we remove that, that's, but yeah, like we're still looking at different ideas. About the definition of the cold waves, um, it is based on a reference period, so I don't know if I said it, but the threshold uh, is based on a certain reference period, but it is, uh, uh, it's true, it's changing uh, by day. Yeah, I think it's the, same with, it's the same with heat waves. Actually, we took the definition for the heat wave that is used in the group and uh, applied it for uh, cold waves. And I think it's the same. It really matters what kind of, I mean, it should not matter much, but it does matter, for, especially for the special uh, structure the definition that you use. So, yeah, I I think it's the same uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, may I ask a second question to Olivia? Sure. Okay. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Joe Wang from University of Illinois. Um, Olivia, you mentioned uh, like uh, impacts oriented forecasts. I think that is a very important uh, topic. But uh, see if we consider like a uh, blocking of the same intensity and the same duration. If we place it in different regions and the different seasons, the impacts can be different. 
So basically, the like the impacts need uh, needs to be impact based forecasts need to be tailored based on re, uh, region and the season. Maybe also like the targeted users. Uh, hold hold this like the this uh, complex factors be taken into account. I know this is a difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe I. I let you know what my thoughts would be how blocking plays uh, comes into play and that would be that you might get predictability from the block so the the impact you would have to model from the uh, basically from the from the model output with a with an impact model but you could use the information that blocking is present or is not present in basically in a statistical in a statistical model that you would put on top of the numerical weather prediction model and that could um, help you with gaining some predictability thank you are we going online or what we have a virtual question from christian grams please christian please. Okay, um, sorry, we have an echo. We have a virtual conference hub at Zurich, um, and I'm Christian Krams from uh, Meteor Swiss. I have a question to, to Lance. Um, you, you stress that the jet stream downstream of the block was uh, essential for the, uh, and the crew forcing the jet entrance for the flooding over Pakistan. I'm wondering um, how much is this jet formation um, affected by the uh, Tibetan plateau and the Himalaya. I wonder if this irrotational wind um, from the from the south uh, can still strengthen the jet if there is uh, such a high orography and literally you only have half of the height of the um, of the troposphere. So what are your thoughts about the relevance of the Tibetan plateau for this uh, jet stream formation in, in summer? Sorry, I forgot to. Sorry, I forgot to. The, um, yeah, the Tibetan Plateau is very high, obviously. But what you did, what you banked up on the north side of the Tibetan Plateau, you banked up a lot of relatively cold air for the time of the year that came out of the higher latitudes in there. And so, in the, in basically, that impacted the meridional temperature gradient in a way that you just normally don't get in that, in that part, of the, uh, part of the world. So it's it's not the jet alone that did it. It's not the westward propagating Bengal Bay of Bengal disturbances alone that did it. It's the combination of of both, uh, and that happened because of the remarkable upstream ridge that was very persistent, and that was, could be linked to the severe weather over uh, Corsica into southern Europe. Um, in there, um, these are all linked. To, these are all linked events. And when you start looking at things on time scales of like 10 to 20 days, and this is what to me is really fun about S2S on the lower end of transition from synoptic to S2S time scales. Um, the bit players that normally would be neglected become very important uh, when you start talking about time scales of like 10 to 20, 25 days. Okay, thank you. But you you think that in addition, the look basically that the trough. Um, uh, happened all, over the Tibetan plateau was essential to get the jet strength. Yeah, and the, but the trough axis was further to the west because the downstream of the big blocking uh, a high over Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so the, mm -hmm. the entrance region of the jet was really um, more north of Pakistan um, than over the core of the Tibetan plateau. Okay, thanks for verification. Thanks for your question. Good one. Got you right here. All right, so this is the lightning round. We got like five minutes left, so make your questions quick, make your answers quick. Okay, um, um, and thank you. Um, I have a question up, um, to Kira, and thank you for your talk at first. Um, my question is, I'm curious about uh, what's the contribution uh, from the external, uh, external forcing and the climate internal variability to the increase in the uh, extreme um, cold wave and the uh, Zonal, zonal pattern, zonal jet pattern. Yeah, I, I think the 
uh, the global warming effects may make more contribution to the uh, decreased trends in the cold, uh, cold events. But what was the case? Uh, how about um, that in the zonal jet pattern? Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Uh, I'm not sure I have the answer. Um, um, I, I think the same as you that it's climate change uh, makes uh, uh, temperature extremes to be uh, um, make it easier, let's say, to to have more and more uh, uh, hot extremes than cold extremes. But um, in terms of external forcing, we do have, uh, of course, um, changes in the ocean, but that can be uh, so. Okay, and also changes in sea ice. So. First, when I looked at the, at, the, at, the, at the cold blob in the North Atlantic, then um, so something it's, it's more driven by uh, freshwater influx due to uh, melting Arctic um, sea ice. Uh, but then there's also a different view on that. So I did some reading. There's a different view that actually the atmosphere, the integrated influence of the atmosphere is driving the ocean. So I'm, that's, I'm not sure I have the answer on that, <laughs> let's say. But then uh, and in terms of changes, uh, yeah, but it also could be, of course, the changes in the stratosphere. We saw that it can increase uh, cold waves in certain regions. So it could be that, uh, yes, I'm not sure I have the answer. But I, yes. <laughs> well, one more quick question. Uh, um, are you going to um, uh, um, check the results by using the large sample data? No, good idea. Uh, I was thinking more to take it into, um, so we definitely need more data, and I was thinking to take it more to, um, more close to me is the using S2S uh, forecast, so this will, because it has so many ensemble members, we could have many more samples or realizations of, of reality, and then we can try to understand more about changes, but then this will not, again, it only goes back 20 years, so yeah, I can look into that, this is, this okay, can be okay. relevant. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Maybe one last question, and if you have other questions, just uh, walk up to them on the side. Anyone else from the virtual chat? Um, so if anyone in the room has a question, feel free to walk up to the mic. Hi, uh, I'm Xiao Yu. I'm from Washington State University. My question is for your decreased uh, trend, is that more for frequency? I'm wondering if you check the intensity of the cold waves? Uh, good point. Yeah, we didn't look at the density, only on the frequency and 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 uh, also the mask of weather having or not. Uh, for each bridge point, is it related to a, a cold wave or is it part of a cold wave or not? Uh, yes, maybe intensity can also be relevant for that. Uh, um, it's a good idea. Thank you. I, s I saw there was someone over here that maybe had a quick question. No? Oh, all right. Yeah, one very last question. There you go. There's your hand one more time. Sorry about that. All right. Again, thank you, everybody. Uh, Lance, so, or to anybody, but really to, I guess, maybe specifically to your talk. So um, you mentioned, you know, the, the link between the climate and the weather community. In the cases, in the case that you brought up, how much or what features of what you showed may or were predictable beyond, say, 10 days? If the persistent ridges probably have under certain situations, as we've seen, ability to, um, that there's going to be in a positive height anomaly located over a certain area. But that's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition yeah, to say that's, 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 the, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I, I think that's the, right. There's a little bit of animal farm meteorology here. All ridges are equal, but some ridges are more equal than others, and we don't know what that's going to be on timescales of 10 to 20 days. Yeah, so I think that that's the, it's going to be the key, one of the key bridges um, that needs to be kind of, you know. Yeah, which is why weather scientists and climate scientists need to talk to each other more. All right. Yeah, so before we go to the break, um, just one comment. Um, yeah, there was this obviously fantastic set of talks. I'm just wondering for you, Lance, um, if you're working with anybody in the Pakistan area on this. Uh, no, this is just something I watched happen in real time and they asked what's going on. Um, I, I, have not, I don't have any colleagues or anyone from Pakistan uh, uh, that I know of. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that'd be fantastic if you could link up with some people over there and perhaps include them to the conversation. That'd be great. But um, Anyway, 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our fantastic speakers. Please, another round of applause. Hey everyone, if you can grab your seats, we're going to start our next session, which is our lightning talks um, for our virtual posters. So how this is going to work is each person's going to present a three minute um, slide version of their poster. And uh, we are going to move from one person to another uh, fairly quickly. So um, our first presenter is Corey Baggett. So Corey, are you, okay, perfect, we see you. So uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay, great, thank you. So yes, my name is Corey Baggett. I'm a uh, meteorologist at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. Um, thank you for this opportunity today to uh, share some work we have been conducting internally on what we're calling a regime change prognostic tool. So I have our project team listed here, but I wanna do a special call out to Emerson LaJoy. Um, she's actually in attendance um, this week. So feel free to reach out to her with questions or feedback over the next few days. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So yeah, so project motivation. So as the name implies, regime change prognostic tool, we're interested in knowing when big shifts in the weather occur on S2S timescales. Um, typically our forecast tools within CPC itself uh, focus on weekly averages, and but we do have daily information available that we're not harnessing from these models that we could probably get some probabilistic information on when big regime changes may occur. So um, just an example on the upper left here is the mid-December 2022 Arctic air outbreak. Um, um, this is an abrupt, but rather short-lived Arctic air outbreak that uh, had really massive impacts across the United States. Um, this is a snapshot from December 23rd um, of cold and snow hazards. So anywhere there's color on that map, you had cold or snow hazards that people were having to deal with. And of course, this is a busy travel time of year with the Christmas and New Year's holiday. So this, a lot of people were impacted by this. Um, on the right here is just an example of how impressive this cool down was. So you have the one week average temperature anomaly beginning December 10th, and then followed uh, the, by the second week, December 17th through December 23rd. So you can see there's a major cool down from one week to the next. So it turns out we did message that relatively well within CPC's framework, but what we kind of missed on was the ending of this outbreak and how fast and how extreme it would shift back to warm. Um, so on the bottom left here, we have the weekly temperature anomaly beginning December 20th, followed by the weekly temperature anomaly uh, beginning uh, December 27th. And this was in a very extreme uh, warm-up. And we looked at kind of the, you know, this warm-up in the context of historical distributions, and it's way out on the right tail um, in terms of week-to-week -week changes towards warm temperatures. So stakeholders and users and the public are very interested in this sort of more finessed information rather than just weekly means, like what does the week look like? Or what does a two-week week period look like? Is there some information that the dynamical models can give us some probabilistic space that would be useful for them. So those are the questions we are asking. What are, what are the timing, magnitude, and durations of these sort of regime changes? And are they predictable in probabilistic space by the subseasonal dynamical models? Also, a, a secondary aspect is how well do we message these regime changes? Are there ways that we can improve that? So the goal here is, as I had said, is enhanced messaging of the timing, magnitude, and duration of major impactful regime changes for the public and stake, stakeholders. So um, that's the motivation. I encourage folks to look at the post strong line. Um, we have a slew of observational statistics calculated, and we've also begun diving into the dynamical models themselves to produce probabilistic forecasts of these regime changes. Um, over the course of the next few days, I'm, I'm, we're seeking feedback, Emerson and I, um, from the scientific and stakeholder communities um, to help tailor the tool towards addressing specific user needs. So um, that's my lightning talk. Thank you. So much. And um... If you have any questions, we encourage you to reach out to each of the speakers uh, through email or, um, you know, virtually if you can. So our next talk is from Yan Rui Chen. Um, so feel free to take it away when you're ready. Thanks. So let's begin the quick talk with a very short news that during the Christmas of the 2019, a giant bulb of hot water more than twice the size of California threatened the survival of fish and the coral near the New Zealand. So after two stages of generation that showed in the figure, this hot water turned into a very severe marine heat wave with the mixed layer depth decreased about 60%. So here's the question, how could the SST keep climbing for about two months? And the answer from the mixed layer heat budget tells us that this warming was mainly caused by the survey heat flux anomaly at the right line here. So the shallow mixed layer discussed above was also very crucial here because it tended to amplify the heating effects of the fluxes. 
If we move on, we could see that decreased surface wind, which is increased uh, in the blue line, is uh, very responsible for the shallow mixed layer that a strong correlation stands between their variations. However, before moving to the reason for the negative winds, I'd like to record the idea of recurrence, which was just introduced by Professor Olivia, as I may call it, an interrupted sequence. And uh, may shift to the next slide. Yeah, sex. Uh, during this event, the interrupted sequence was consistent of synoptic Rossby waves decree, and uh, the decrease in winds here illustrated by red was highly consistent with the recurrent signal showed by the black dashed line in the map, or like the very clear repeated sequence. So this existence of recurrent wave was also supported by the R index in blue contours, which represent the level of recurrence. Therefore, we can now feel the whole story that strong uh, recurrent waves lead to persistent high pressure system east of New Zealand, which slow down the surface wind and decrease the cloud cover. The steel breeze over the ocean then resulted in a shallow mixed layer, which amplified the, uh, the heating effect of the solar radiation and the, leading to the severe marine heat wave we've saw. So uh, we've also explored the role of blocking as here that the blocking did not show up until the end of the event. So at least for this event, the recurrence got the upper hand. And as for the take home message, you can click the uh, Please, the PowerPoint. Thanks. So, for the animation to show up. Uh, okay. It, it seems that the animation didn't show up. So, the uh, main take home message that the, is the recurrence can also trigger the extreme events. And that's my last house six. Thank you so much. Awesome. Let's give our presenter a hand. We are doing excellent on timing, everyone. So if we continue uh, rocking and rolling, we might um, have time for a question or two at the end. Um, our next presenter is Ping Liu. Hi, uh, thank you. I didn't expect this one to be me, but anyways, thank you very much. There is about a, the uh, extreme uh, heat events increase in trend over the United States and supported by a NOAA grant. Can you go to the next page, please? We will uh, present several points here. One, there was a <clears throat> excuse me, significant upward, upward trends in extreme heat waves over the Western United States, but there's some uh, monthly uh, ex uh, differences we'll see. And climate warming uh, contributes about 10 to 20 percent to this warming. Then the rest will be controlled by the persistent high pressure systems, including persistent ridges, blocking highs about 60 to 100 percent. So we diagnose the, from the perspective of QGPV, uh, which is, we'll see that uh, in significantly decreasing. Uh, we inverted the uh, QGPV tendencies to see the contributions of, from the elevation of vorticity and uh, temperatures. So we'll see the, their magnitude. So next slide, please. Yeah, left hand side, we'll see a significantly upward trend in heat wave uh, frequency defined by after Rosie, et cetera, in their paper, they also showed the similar uh, results over the Western United States. Uh, global, again, climate warming uh, indicated by this uh, area mean to meter temperature anomalies. Also, we see some upward trends, but only about 10 to 20% contributions. Next slide, please. Now, error mean the QGPV on the right hand side from these three, uh, three months. Three months all showing decrease in trend during the past several decades. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, first time we saw that. Next slide, please. So we inverted the QGPV equation, the tendency equation. We uh, we removed the overlapped uh, terms in those uh, two uh, original terms. So we cleanly separated into the elevation of vorticity and elevation of temperature. These two all have we uh, we see some upper trend. And the advection of vorticity showing a larger magnitude contribution to the whole uh, trend. We're doing more analysis on this. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Jai Wang Ma. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Jai Wang Ma from the uh, Southern Marine Laboratory, uh, China. So I I'm going to share some new findings on 
to fundamental issues in the atmospheric blocking dynamics. So before we dive into blocking dynamics, I uh, uh, two problems in conventional multiscale energy energetic uh, formalism should be clarified in advance. Uh, for the first problem, we started from an example. So if we have a signal with only two components, so what, what's their uh, respective energy? And uh, empirical expression is, is uh, uh, you tell the prime, uh, square and you prime square, but this is conceptually wrong. Uh, we all know from the uh, Fourier power spectral that uh, uh, the energy of these two components should be a zero square and a one square. Uh, the the point uh, the point that we want to emphasize is that uh, uh, multiscale energy is a uh, uh, phase space notion is not a, a physical space notion. Uh, but also, we have another problem is, is that uh, for, for, uh, Fourier co uh, coefficients do not have local information. So we, we may use uh, wavelength analysis, but this is not enough. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the wavelength uh, uh, bases have for different resolution for different scales. Uh, the larger the scale, uh, uh, the more local information lost. So to overcome this weakness, we use a newly uh, developed uh, uh, functional analysis method called multi-scale window transform. Uh, for the second problem, it's uh, the separation of uh, uh, color scale transfer and the uh, transport processes. Uh, the separation of these two uh, processes is subjective, and this may be pro pro uh, problematic. So, uh, for example, in the traditional uh, multiscale energy equation, uh, the right-hand side terms represent the power scale uh, transfer. But uh, the sum of this, uh, uh, these terms do not equal to zero. This means that energy is not conserved. So to, to overcome this, to, to solve this problem, we use the canonical transfer theory. In this theory, uh, uh, the power scale transfer and the transport processes can be uh, rigorously derived. So the separation between these two uh, processes is not a problem anymore. Um, and this, the resulting transfer has a lead bracket form, like a Poisson bracket in Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, next slide, please. So after solving the uh, two uh, problem, we, we got some uh, new findings about uh, Blocking dynamics. For the first one is that we find the upscale forcing is uh, uh, the upscale forcing dominant downstream, not upstream. This, this is quite different from the famous ID strain mechanism, where the upscale forcing is uh, hypothesized to be in the upstream. And uh, the the the, uh, the second one is that uh, we find Bertropic instability has a doubler structure with a positive center in the upstream and the negative center in the downstream. So this means that Bertropic instability can be crucial to uh, blocking uh, development in a specific region, just like in the upstream, uh, the Bertropic uh, instability contributes a lot to its de uh, development. Uh, that's all, thank you. Um, so we will move on to Emmanuel Russo and um, Duncan will have you present in a couple minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Emanuele and I'm a postdoc at ETH Zurich in the group of Daniela de Meissen. Here, I'm going to give you a short uh, introduction of uh, our project called Hit Forecast. And um, I'm going to um, present the results of a, a specific case study. In this project, next, next slide, please. In this project, we mainly, uh, our goal is to try to better understand the, the processes that are responsible for heat waves. And we aim to do so by uh, building a, a hierarchy of climate models of different complexity by applying uh, stepwise increases in the um, complexity of, of, of the model and um, testing at each step of the hierarchy um, different processes. Uh, next, here we use the, as a model, we use the German model icon, and uh, we normally uh, target um, 
uh, horizontal resolution of approximately 160 kilometers, and we have in the vertical uh, 47 uh, levels up to um, so, uh, approximately 80 kilometers. Next, please. Um, as I said, in, uh, in my post, I focus on a particular case study where we use a very simplified model version, the held and Suarez configuration, uh, to study the role of boundary layer friction on um, mid latitude heat waves. Um, the held and Suarez configuration basically is simply a dry dynamical core with um, physical parameterizations that are substituted by next. Uh, I think you can go twice to speed it up. Um, uh, an equilib um, a forcing of the temperature tendencies toward an equilibrium profile that, it, that depends on the latitude and uh, on the altitude. And then by next, please, a linear damping on low level winds representing a boundary layer friction. And here in, in this plot, we see that uh, the damping factor Kb is a function of the altitude and goes to zero at uh, 0 0.7 sigma levels. So we use this model configuration next to uh, apply changes, local changes in the value of the boundary layer friction and try to mimic the effect of uh, differences uh, in different surface types, such as ocean and land on uh, heat waves. Please, uh, next. Um, so studying the effect of, of, of changes, local changes in boundary layer friction on, on heat waves. Finally, the next slide, I just summarized the results here. We basically see that um, mid um, boundary layer friction plays an important role in modulating heat waves. And depending on where we modify the, the underground or a constant boundary layer friction, uh, at which latitudes, uh, the extent of the area where we apply the changes. And when we consider different uh, areas together and we position them at different longitudinal distance, we see that all these factors play an important role uh, in terms of mid-latitude heat waves. And here uh, I just report the, an example of the changes that we obtained by increasing the value of boundary layer friction over uh, um, realistic, let's say, continental areas for North America and Europe and the both considered together. Thank you very much. For further questions, you can refer to my email. Thank, Thank you so much. Good news, we have Duncan back. Um, so we're gonna let him present. Yeah. Um, thank you, should work this time around. So, hello again, everyone. I'm Duncan, a PhD student at the University of Bern in Switzerland. I'm happy for the opportunity to briefly say a few words um, about my work. So, sometimes we experience periods of anomalous heat lasting beyond 10 days to, in rarer cases, even as long as almost a month. And weather persistence at this sub-seasonal to seasonal timescale, as we have seen so far in the workshop, can severely impact our human and natural systems. And so definitely they deserve our attention. Um, we have an idea of some of the processes that might be conducive to such long-lasting events, but we're still far from a, a from a comprehensive picture. And this is where my work tries to make some headway. So in the slides, you'll see, I have looked at um, select regions in Europe that I obtained with a specific clustering procedure with era five reanalysis data. And I defined for each of these regions, um, long lasting and short duration hot spells. And then I can compare the associated dynamics of these events. So the figure on the slide shows blocking frequency anomaly composites for long and short hot spells in central Western Europe. And perhaps unsurprisingly, we see that compared to short spells, the longer events are associated with higher frequency and a greater spatial extent of blocks and the stationarity of such a flow situation. And it's possible as well recurrence in a short amount of time is um, likely to induce persistent heat at the surface. Uh, next slide, please. Um, however, looking at the individual events reveals the real complexity of the many processes at play. Um, each dot here in the left-hand panel represents a persistent hot spell, and these are associated with differing fractions of 
blocking during their lifetime. And the three examples that I show are just basically simplified schematics to show that long spells can occur despite wetter than average um, soils or absence even of blocking or absence of recurrent Rossby wave packets, which are another process sought to induce persistence. Um, and also we see different configurations of Rossby wave breaking. Um, so in a way, just like atmospheric blocking itself, we hinted to this earlier, but the, ca the characterization, let alone the, the successful prediction of these persistent heat events is complex and challenging, um, but comparing the long and short events could give hints to ingredients that might help the predictability of the, the former. Um, so yeah, this is just a brief overview. Um, for more details, don't hesitate to contact me for questions or further discussion. Thank you very much. And lastly, in today's uh, virtual poster session, we have Henry Scholler. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So my name is Henry Scholler. I'm working uh, with the people mentioned on the slide at the University of Berlin, and which in my PhD, we're trying to investigate uh, blockings using advanced methods and theory from mathematics. Next slide, please. So the first uh, interesting topic we would like to tackle are these warm conveyor belts that have been mentioned today already. And there has been significant interest in them recently, but to this day, to the best of our knowledge, uh, they have only been identified on an individual trajectory level and using some arbitrary threshold on theta, the potential temperature. And um, what we're doing in the study I'm presenting here is we're trying to um, cluster trajectories uh, that were calculated from these uh, blockings based on their geometric information. So next, please. Yeah, you can click again. So um, with advanced methods from uh, mathematics, we have been able to uh, apply a methodology that uh, identifies um, clusters of trajectories um, objectively. And based on these clusters, we were able to investigate their dynamic properties. This slide is a little off, I'm sorry for that. So basically you can check out our poster and I'm happy to walk you through the methodology that we've developed to sort of objectify the selection of these warm conveyor belts. Thanks. Thank you all so much to our virtual presenters. We do have three minutes left in this session. So if anyone has a, a question um, for one of the posters, we, we have time. Hi, it's uh, Xiaoyu again. I have a question for Dr. Liu Ping. Um, yes. Yeah. So I see you, your, uh, this talk, you are using PV to identify their effects on the heat waves. And you have like several paper talking about using geopotential height, diff, um, zonal like daily eddies to identify a region. Do you see a difference or very similarity between these two methods? Uh, they are similar, the dynamically similarly, they, they should be the same. Uh, well, I also have that a similar uh, uh, problem when we look at this uh, phenomenon, uh, that why is a blocking, traditional blocking with, with a zonal wind uh, flow, uh, flow uh, bifurcation or reversal. The other is that we don't see a established reversal of the zonal winds, we only see those persistent ridges. So we think it might be helpful to combine these two using persistent high pressure systems. In terms of the uh, PV or QGPV in this case, it's as shown before, it's really a good indicator for blocking as well. So we, we saw that there was there's some some uh, in, some uh, established trends in heat waves and also controlled by these persistent high, persistent high pressure systems. So we think we might should we might look at the how the QGPV uh, uh, changing in the past decades. And we saw that we inverted that equation. So we get the tendency for the geopotential height. It turns out they are consistent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I do have a couple announcements before everyone jumps up, but let's give another round of applause to all of our presenters. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can we come back in? We're going to start the afternoon session. Um, now, um, 
All right, uh, welcome back to the afternoon session and welcome to start with the theory, diagnostic and hierarchical modeling of blocking. Um, and we're going to start with the first invited talk given by Nabor Nakamura from University of Chicago. Okay, thank you organizers for this unique meeting and thank you for inviting me to speak. So today I'd like to talk about um, theories of atmospheric blocking in the style of a historical overview and later add my own take on where things stand uh, in the theory of atmospheric blocking. And hopefully this will stimulate some discussion about future directions of research. Okay, so it's been 70 years or even more since atmospheric blocking was first documented, documented by these two celebrated papers by Berggren et al. and by Rex. And this is the time when uh, background instability theories by Chani, Edi, and um, Phillips uh, was, was, uh, was coming out. So um, it's been a long time, but I think it's fair to say that uh, unlike barricolink instability, today we still don't have the standard theory for atmospheric blocking. And the main challenge here is that atmospheric blocking lies somewhere between um, the two uh, familiar domains of mid-latitude large-scale circulation, namely Rossby waves and macro turbulence. Um, so we all agree, I think, that the jet stream, I'm um, sorry, the, the blocking uh, represents a persistent anomalous meandering of the jet stream that's hard to predict. But whether you take um, a wave perspective, uh, to, to this phenomenon, or if you view blocking as an emergence of an unstable uh, stationary, uh, quasi-stationary uh, uh, state in, in the high-dimensional dynamical systems, um, you know, that, 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 that will change the kind of questions uh, that you're going to address quite dramatically. So uh, we will have a diverse theories of atmospheric blocking. And so, uh, studying uh, with the very beginning, so the, historically, the theory of blocking started out as a wave perspective. And so, this paper by um, T.C. Ye um, discusses about the, uh, the dispersive nature of, 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 of Rossby waves. So, so he, he's thinking about the meandering nature of the jet stream as the manifestation of Rossby waves. And one of his conclusions is that the large meandering of the jet stream can arise from simply uh, having uh, a constructive interference of different wave components. And in particular, at higher latitudes where beta is small, then Rossby waves tend to be less dispersive and therefore these high um, amplitude meandering uh, events uh, tend to last longer. So that's, uh, th those are the natures, uh, those, those are the nature of, of uh, Rossby waves. But, but Rossby himself, who was the, the advisor of uh, OTCA, uh, thought, well, that's true, but also, uh, what about flow? The flow can change quite dramatically across a block. Uh, and, uh, and this is somewhat similar to hydraulic jump. Uh, and um, so basically, um, across the jump, uh, mass flux and the momentum flux are continuous, but there is a sort of discontinuous variation in the, the speed of the westerly wind and the width of the jet stream. And in the upstream of the jump, the wind is stronger, so the, the group velocity, Doppler shifted group velocity Rossby wave is downstream or the, the eastward. But uh, in the downstream of the jump, the wind is weaker, so the group velocity Rossby wave turns westward, uh, the negative. And so you now have a transition from the supercritical state to the, the low, uh, and the subcritical state. Uh, and this maintains the stationary jump, hydraulic jump in the jet stream, which uh, Rossby likened to, to atmospheric blocking. Now, a Ye's paper talked about Rossby waves, but where, where do waves come from? Um, so, one obvious source of waves, Rossby waves, is back link instability, but also uh, uh, mountain talks, as the pressure talks of mountains or form stress, uh, is very important. And um, uh, as Form stress of a mountain maximizes when the phase velocity of Rossby waves, Doppler shifted phase velocity of Rossby waves vanishes, and this is called resonant amplification. 
and uh, 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 and Tong and Linzen were among the first to propose that this this uh, as a mechanism of block formation. Now, uh, resonant amplification can be suppressed by the presence of friction and other damping mechanisms. So after this, uh, it, it didn't uh, get a lot of traction uh, until uh, much later, uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, when Petrowski et al. picked up uh, this theme and somewhat rekindled the interest uh, in this mechanism at the summertime block formation. Now, Cherney and DeVore um, took the theory a step further and he combined, they combined um, the resonance and the wave mean flow interaction in a simple biotropic model and uh, they, it, demonstrated that this model has two possible stationary uh, states and or weather regimes, if you will. Um, and the one regime is more zonally oriented or high index regime, and the other one is a high wavy state called the low index regime. And they propose that the blocking is a transition from a high indexed regime to uh, a low index regime. Now later, um, researchers added more wave components and uh, considered wave-wave interaction in, addi in addition to wave mean flow interaction. Um, and so uh, basically they considered the problem as high dimensional deterministic chaos or dynamic consistence theory. And uh, what they found is that these two stationary uh, equilibria in Charlie DeVore uh, theory would be replaced by quasi-stationary, not quite stationary, but quasi-stationary uh, attractors, if you will. Uh, some of them uh, resembled uh, low index, and some of them uh, resembled high index states. And so uh, this type of approach uh, helped to, uh, to, to improve our understanding of, of predictability of, of blocking. So some of the uh, blocking states. So, those blocking states is the manifestation of unstable periodic orbit in in, the, in high dimensional dynamical systems. And there has been this, uh, quite extensive literature uh, arising from uh, studying from uh, 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 for Ligla and Gill back in 1984, 85. Okay, uh, somewhat independently, uh, Jim McWilliams showed that. Um, a pair of vortices, um, anti-symmetric vortices called modon is an exact solution to an equivalent paratropic equations. And he suggested that this uh, would be a prototype of Rex type blocking. Um, yeah, but his solution required uh, some specific conditions, that, that including there's no uh, wave solution on the out, uh, far field. So it remains somewhat unclear how uh, wavy circulation will evolve into, into the modon. But nevertheless, uh, this line of research was later succeeded by a series of studies uh, on uh, the stationary, oh, I'm sorry, the, the isolated, uh, uh, isolated uh, uh, eddy uh, in the jet stream uh, represented by uh, weekly nonlinear theory uh, using KDB and nonlinear uh, 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 shredding equations. Okay, so uh, block is a low frequency phenomenon, but um, uh, sometimes transient eddies also augment uh, the uh, the blocking phenomenon. So the interaction between high frequency uh, eddies and the low frequency eddy is a very important part of understanding the maintenance of blocking. Um, uh, Glenn Schutt um, show that uh, a simple using a simple biotech model that uh, incident transient eddies from upstream. When, it, when they encounter a difluent jet stream, the jet stream tends to, difluent flow tends to strain the eddies in such a way as to reinforce the difluent structure of the flow. Um, I didn't have, I don't, I don't have a glance just a picture, maybe Tim can find one for me. But, um, uh, so uh, later, uh, Akira Yamazaki and Hisanori Ito generalized this idea uh, into uh, uh, absorptive, absorpt, uh, selective absorption mechanism, which is essentially a collection of small uh, smaller vortices by the large vortex of the same sign. Uh, so this is such an merger of vortices of like signed vortices. And so these uh, mechanisms are sort of different manifestations of upscale cascade uh, within the jet stream. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, De Hailu has a series of papers in which um, he explicitly uh, you know, quantified the uh, feedback of, of uh, transient uh, eddies onto a slow, uh, low frequency uh, waves. And um, even though um, uh, the analytic solution was limited to some specific waveforms, but but his low frequency uh, dynamics is, is, is concisely expressed in nonlinear uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. And, um, and his solution shows that the pre existing isolated uh, block uh, will, will grow and decay uh, by the incident wave forcing from, from transients from coming from upstream. So this has been a sort of successful simulation, theoretical simulation of block life cycle. Um, now, um, Kyle Swanson, uh, around 2000, uh, also showed that you actually don't need uh, transient waves to generate blocks. And in his theory and, and simple model, basically um, uh, a stationary wave generated by upstream topography stagnates where um, the group velocity of the uh, the stationary wave vanishes. So this is a local uh, vanishing of a group velocity. And when this happens, the, uh, the, uh, the, the wave activity of the stationary waves accumulates in this region and initiates uh, a large scale wave breaking and self-second blocking. Okay. Um, okay, so fast forward to 2016 and when we, when, when Claire Wan and I wrote, uh, a paper about local wave ac activity. Um, we had Kyle Swanson's work in mind, and we wanted to generalize his result uh, using um, uh, a local conservation law that, that applies to finite amplitude wave activity, finite amplitude Rossby waves, and geostrophic eddies. So, local wave activity is a measure of the meandering of. Uh, of the uh, of, of, of the potential vorticity contour, or the measure of displacements of quasi geostrophic potential vorticity relative to a reference zonal state, um, and um, we can actually use this to diagnose uh, blocking events. And it turns out um, uh, this this quantity, first of all, is is by definition a positive non-negative number. Uh, so it measures uh, the local amplitude of the wave. And furthermore, uh, this uh, successfully, uh, this, this is basically this quantity is the largest uh, in mid latitude and the greatest values of local wave activity tend to capture blocking events rather successfully. So um, the reason why we um, care about this quantity is that this quantity follows a simple local conservation law. And so here F, um, denotes uh, the flux of wave activity A, and S and D are sources and sinks. Uh, now, if you just assume that the wave activity only travels one-dimensionally along the jet stream, then this equation simply becomes a 1D transport equation. And in between the forcing and sink, uh, S and D can be ignored. So we can just rewrite this equation in this following form, an advective form. And you can tell that this um, partial derivative of flux with respect to wave activity plays a role of effective advective velocity for wave activity. Okay. So if this velocity is positive throughout the channel, the wave activity uh, or the wave packet uh, entering from the left will traverse simply traverses to, to, to the right. Um, but if this effective advective velocity changes sign somewhere in the domain, then the wave front will stagnate there, and therefore the, the flux that comes from upstream will, will converge toward that stagnated point, and therefore there will be an accumulation of wave activity and the, the amplitude grows uh, uh, lo uh, locally. So this is the, essentially uh, the idea about the traffic jump theory. And um, the question is whether this uh, accumulation or the, the change uh, from the uh, transmission to stagnation can occur spontaneously. And a key to this transition is the wave's ability to alter the mean flow. Um, so the flux of wave activity is a sum of the advective uh, flux and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the radiation stress of the wave propagation, or AP flux, if you will, uh, so, um, so it involves the vection by the background zonal wind. This background zonal wind also gets decelerated as wave amplitude 
uh, increases. And so um, you can show this uh, theoretically for idealized flows, but uh, it is very robust observationally as well. So there is a, a very robust negative correlation between the column average vertically average wave activity and wave vertically average zone in wind um, with a coefficient of minus alpha, where alpha is a number that's between zero and one. It would be one for biotropic case, but for baroclinic case, alpha is less than vertical structure wave activity is different from the vertical structure of the zone of wind, and therefore alpha tends to be smaller than one. Anyway, this alpha is very important because this introduces AD flow interaction. And if you just plug this uh, uh, expression into the equation, you can see this flux is a quadratic function of wave activity. Okay. And you can further decompose the wave into a stationary component and transient component. But stationary, I should really say steady component. It really doesn't depend on time at all, but has some waviness in it. Uh, and everything that depends on time. Um, if you do that, then you can just rewrite this equation for the transient component, and you get something like this. And again, you have a quadratic uh, uh, flux with respect to wave activity, but this wave activity is for the transient component that is modulated by the stationary component through this parameter C, uh, which is smaller where the, um, where the, uh, the stationary wave has, has large amplitude. Okay, so, um, uh, so since this is flux is quadratic, that means that at small amplitude of wave activity, the flux increases with increasing wave activity. But as wave activity increases, it decelerates the mean flow, and therefore the advective part of the flux will decrease uh, with, with, with increasing altitude, uh, amplitude. And as, as a result, at some point, uh, the flux will start to decrease as you keep increasing wave activity. So that means that there is a maximum uh, possible flux um, for any given location, and this is what we call the carrying capacity of the jet stream. And once you reach this carrying capacity and go beyond uh, the, the threshold value of the wave activity, uh, there is a, a natural transition from a trans, uh, transmission to stagnation because the slope of this curve, quadratic curve, is, is this um, the effective advective velocity of, of the system, and once this uh, the maximum uh, carrying capacity is reached, this velocity goes to zero, therefore stagnation occurs. So how does this play out in the numerical model? So this is just an illustration of edge wave traveling from the left uh, through uh, a channel in which the zone of wind changes. The zone of wind is weaker in the middle of the channel, so it, it tends to increase the amplitude of local wave activity. But on the left, um, the, the wave activity managed to stay below the threshold, and therefore the wave, uh, wave packet continues to migrate from left to the right. Uh, but on the right column, um, the wave activity coming from uh, the upstream is slightly larger, uh, so the flux is slightly larger, and therefore the wave activity managed to go over the threshold. And then when this happens, the wave envelope uh, starts to, to develop uh, discontinuity and grows. Uh, while the wave phase is squeezed, but still managed to transmit uh, further to the right. Okay, and here's a 2D version of the simulation. Um, and so this is like a potential vorticity in the top and the bottom of the streamline, uh, streamline uh, stream function. And as the edge wave stagnates around the defluent region, the PV anomalies gets um, entrained and mixed into a pair of vertices. And in the stream function, you see the, the emergence of uh, the Rex type block. Okay. So this behavior of potential vorticity is very much akin to um, the absorption, so, uh, selective absorption mechanism uh, proposed by Yamazaki and Ito earlier. Okay, okay so um, you know these models are obviously highly idealized. They're not, me they're not meant to uh, for um, for accurate prediction of individual uh, blocking events, but uh, since 1D models in particular is so cheap uh, to run and also it sort of externalizes all the parameters, we can actually run this model uh, with much, much longer and test the sensitivity of blocking frequency against climate change. So uh, this paper uh, was by uh, three participants uh, of uh, 2018, Raspberry Palooza, um, and what they did is basically run the 1D model with stochastic forcing uh, with varying uh, jet streams. So um, 
they gradually decrease the overall speed of the jet stream um, and, and see what happens. So the jet stream uh, weakens from top panels to, to the bottom. And as the jet stream weakens, you see the emergence of uh, blocking just upstream of the two stationary ridges. But eventually, as the jet stream weakens further, those uh, blocking events tend to merge to, to create perpetual blocks uh, around the edges. So obviously, this, is, this basically tells the story of what would happen if we only change uh, zonal velocity to the speed of jet stream without changing anything else. And obviously, that's a very unrealistic and hypothetical scenario, as uh, my colleague, uh, Pedro Hassan today will, will be able to attest. But at least the model will be able to isolate uh, the independent effect of a zone of mean wind on the frequency and the duration of the, of the block. Um, also, uh, one of the advantages of the um, uh, uh, wave activity perspective is that it can be applied to, 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 to the data directly and to test the theory. So um, uh, recently, Polster and Worth uh, uh, basically examined one single case uh, of uh, blocking uh, over the Atlantic during December 2016, uh, and we did the, uh, the, the ensemble forecasts. Uh, and, um, and basically, the, the results are broadly consistent with 1D uh, model prediction, at least for this particular event. And, um, and, and in particular, the, uh, all, uh, the vast majority of ensemble members underestimated this event. Um, and so the observed uh, blocking, which is indicated by its black line, that's, that's the time series of wave activity, uh, is almost at the top of the ensemble. So what this suggests to me is that the, um, the block was already uh, well into the stagnation uh, regime, and therefore it was almost close to the maximum possible wave activity that the environment suggests. And if that's the case, then it will be very difficult for the model to overestimate such events because as the, um, the, the observed events is already close to, to the maximum possible uh, range. So the, uh, the errors would probably uh, skew toward uh, the negative side. So all, virtually all models sort of underestimated uh, this event. And there's sort of some indirect suggestion that this, at least this event uh, was quite relevant to the uh, uh, traffic jump analogy. Okay, so uh, again, uh, the, uh, the framework is also good for uh, detecting the processes that affects blocking. And so Emily Nee's work uh, identified uh, the upstream diabetic heating associated with uh, cyclogenesis um, uh, of and and the related uh, the warm conveyor belt, uh, uh, which fueled. Uh, downstream blocking a few days later through the generation of wave activity, and which later uh, also caused uh, extreme heat over Pacific Northwest. Um, and so um, th this, is, uh, this is also a collaboration of Stefan Paul's uh, work, uh, recent work, uh, that um, there is significant influence of diabetic heating on, on block formation, particularly during summer. Uh, so, so I think this, uh, you know, uh, the framework, at least, uh, it has has a potential to merge uh, observational work and theoretical work. Okay, so um, I, I think uh, we're still um, in the developmental stage for the theory of blocking, but we're in a very exciting time where there are tons of observational and modeling uh, work on blocking. Just you know, this meeting alone is a very good proof of that. Uh, uh, whether uh, that um, encourages or overwhelms a theorist like me is a, is a matter for, for, for debate. But, but, uh, but, the th but regardless, the role of theorists should be to extract the canonical dynamics of blocking out of diverse manifestations and help form a testable hypothesis uh, and, um, and give a structure for improving predictability. But also the modeling and observational communities can help theorists to, to form new theories and, and so forth. So there should be some more synergy. Uh, so I, I think in addition to the weather climate schism, there is a schism between theory and modeling uh, and that can be mended. So I'd like to end with a note that we have another Rossi Palooza coming up this summer and the theme is climate of extreme events. And so uh, any interested graduate students and, and, uh, and also should apply the application is open through April 28th. Thank you.
So just like the morning session, we're going to have open discussion after all the speakers. So the next one, I believe it's a virtual talk um, given by Professor Walkman Wolf. Right, so um, my presentation will be split in two parts. One, I will slightly briefly recap Nobor's theory for the onset of blocking um, and point to the key aspects. And then I will want to present a novel background state that allows one to um, allows one to use this theory in on an event basis. Next slide. So the motivation is really to investigate the onset of blocking. Um, next slide. So a typical situation would be the North Atlantic. As you know, the jet is stronger typically over the Western North Atlantic compared to the Eastern North Atlantic. And oftentimes blocking is you, you, you see onset of blocking over the Atlantic or the Eastern side of the Atlantic where the where the background wind um, gets weaker downstream. Um, next slide. And um, I want to digress first a little bit and present this traffic jam theory. I'm talking about a one lane in each direction highway, and let's assume there's a speed limit, 100 kilometers per hour, and there's a certain number of ten, well density of, of cars. Next slide. And if you multiply the car density, which is one in this case, with the speed, which is 100, then you get a flux, which is U times A, which is 100 in this case. And it, 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 it quantifies the number of cars that are passing per unit time at a, at a specific point along this highway. Now, um, next slide, if you now increase the density of the cars, like you double the density of cars and assume that the cars still go with 100 meters per second, the flux, also doubled, so two times 100 is 200. Um, and so this is kind of a linear increase, but you, you already realize that this cannot go on forever. So if you now increase the density even further, next slide, um, then um, the situation becomes somewhat dangerous and the cars have to slow down a little bit. So let's assume the car density now is three, but the speed is only has gone down to 67. So if you multiply the two, you, you get 200 again. So that means the increase in car density has been compensated for by the decrease in the speed and the flux kind of um, saturates. You have a maximum uh, of the flux. Next slide, please. And that's the, the, the carrying capacity of the of the highway, right? So if, if more cars come from behind, um, next slide, um, well, you can plot first the, 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 the flux as a function of A, and as long as it's linear, this is just a straight line. But if it's a nonlinear, it kind of, it's getting um, an inverted parabola. Next slide. Now, if more cars are coming from behind, uh, more than the, the, the maximum carrying capacity, or you all know what happens, you get this traffic jam. Next slide. And the nice thing is now that there is a fairly close analogy between this traffic jam and nonlinear Rossby waves on a jet. And that was done nicely by this, by this paper, a science paper by Noburu and Claire Huang. Um, next slide. Um, the, the essential part here is that the, the relation between the flux, which is now the, the wave activity flux of the Rossby waves, and the wave activity A is again kind of a nonlinear function, and, and that's plotted on the left hand side, and it has a maximum at some point, and that's the carrying capacity. Now the maximum wave activity flux that can be carried by the jet. Um, and one important parameter is U, which is the wind of the background state. Next slide. Now, uh, yes, as I said, U is the, the wind from the eddy-free background state, and that eddy-free background state, I think Nobu called it the reference state, that um, I like to call this the zonalized state. And next slide. So this is rather easy to explain. So if you um, it's it's one version of a modified Lagrangian mean. Um, so let's take potential vorticity from observations, and then you zonalize the PV contours. So, so you assume that the, the contours are just like rubber bands and they want to shorten and become more zonal and completely zonal while keeping the area to the north of the contour constant. So that gives you the zonalized background potential vorticity, which is only a function of latitude. It is not a function of longitude any longer, so it's zonally symmetric. And it differs from the zonally average field 
and it's not affected by the waves as long as um, the waves are conservative. Next slide. Um, so as I said, the zonalized background state is zonally symmetric, so it's lacking any gradual zonal variation. Next slide. But we have seen that over, at least over the North Atlantic, um, the background state is not zonally symmetric, um, and so this suggests that we need a zonally varying background state. Next slide. Um, like shown here, North Atlantic, right? So typically strong jet over the Western North Atlantic and weak jet over the Eastern North Atlantic. Next slide. And you have burn clinic, uh, well, eddy generation through burn clinic instability on the Western side and then downstream propagation. But the, the change in the, the gradual change in the background flow also changes the waves. Next slide. So you can set up uh, the wave activity budget which is essentially well, A is wave activity and F is the flux. Um, and the beautiful thing about Nobiru's theory is that this now applies to finite amplitude, large amplitude eddies as well. Next slide. So if you want to go for a stationary solution and consider you focus only on the, on the zonal component, then essentially this equation tells you that F, the zonal component of F should be a constant. Next slide. And um, that's the, the F is then, I, I, as I told you before, that's the, the expression for F. It's U minus alpha times A times A. Next slide. Which is this inverted parabola. So given the F, so that's the flux that comes from the upstream side, this, this graph then tells you an A, so the, 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 the wave activity you get locally. And now as you go downstream, the U, the, the zonalized wind, the speed of the zonalized wind goes down. Next slide. Um, so you have a smaller U in the Eastern Atlantic. So the same F then gives you a larger A. And that's why I, I made these wavy symbols um, larger, larger wave amplitude in the Eastern Atlantic here compared to the Western Atlantic. Next slide. So an important point here is that the maximum of this F that the jet can carry is larger over the Western Atlantic compared to the Eastern Atlantic. So that's this carrying capacity, right? Next slide. And now you can distinguish two interesting um, cases, the, the same that, that was done in the previous presentation, actually. So as long as the flux that's coming from behind is lower than the maximum F that the jet can carry, then everything is fine and the, the waves can just go through downstream, right? Next slide. So that, that would be this situation. So, sort of, I call it quasi-linear wave propagation. Now, the second case, next slide, is, is a case where the F is actually larger than the carrying capacity downstream on the Eastern Atlantic. And in this case, something must happen. And so it's like more cars coming from behind then the, the, the one lane highway can carry. So you get a traffic jam in the case of a traffic flow. And in the case of Rossby waves, you get, next slide, you guess Rossby wave breaking. So in this idealized um, uh, simulation with a front PV front, you get a flow transition, which really looks like um, the onset of blocking. Next slide. Now, the, the key point here is that the carrying capacity, the F max, uh, must vary with longitude. Right, next slide. But on the other hand, the zonalized wind is zonally symmetric by design. So there, there seems to be a, a slight problem when applying this concept to, to, to the North Atlantic. Next slide. So the idea, and that's now the, 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 new, the new background state, the idea is to, to introduce so-called rolling zonalization. Next slide. And um, I want to explain it to you here what we do. So this is um, the, 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 the figure shows um, potential vorticity, a snapshot on the 18th of December on, uh, of 2016. Um, the, the solid lines are the wind and you see sort of a low PV blocking event over the North Atlantic, right? Now, next slide, instead of um, zonalizing over the entire hemisphere, we apply this zonalization procedure only to a, a, a finite sector, a, fi a finite sector um, um, that has a, a width of 60 degrees in longitude. And we do this in a rolling fashion. So next slide. So here are individual sectors. And so we just zonalize PV within the sector and we 
the, the resulting profile we get, we associate with the central latitude of this sector. And so we keep doing this for, for different um, longitudes. And so that gives us a new field, which we call the rolling zonalized background field. Next slide. And that's what it looks like. So it looks a bit like a background state. Again, what's plotted here is the potential, potential vorticity. And you see uh, how the gradient, um, the, the horizontal gradient of PV uh, over the North Atlantic um, decreases as you move downstream towards Europe. Um, next slide. And you can compare this actually to the temporal average of potential vorticity because, and that's interesting because the temporal average has often been used as a background state. And next slide. So you see noticeable differences. Like for instance, in the temporal average on the left hand side, you see contour overturning, which may be a blocking artifact. So the block is rather long lived and kind of has an imprint on the temporal average. On the other hand, in the rolling zonalization, there seems to be no such artifact. It's strictly monotonic by design. There is no overturning. And there seems to be no blocking artifacts. So in a, in, in a certain sense, this looks superior. Next slide. Now we use this in our first paper to, to get a diagnostic for wave guidability. So again, I show you this rolling zonalized background state. And essentially we, we take the, the horizontal gradient as a measure for wave guidability. So the stronger the gradient, the better the waveguide for the rust waves. Next slide. Um, and here you see again that the waveguide weakens over the North Atlantic. Next slide. And um, if you take the waveguideability metric essentially as the horizontal gradient of the logarithm of Q, you get the plot on the on the bottom right. So that's now our waveguideability proxy. And you see that in this specific case, there's a nice waveguide except over the North Atlantic, which suggests that the presence of the blocking kind of interrupts the waveguide. Next slide. Now, if you compare this again on the left hand side to the rolling time average, you, you see kind of artifacts. And um, I would argue that again, the rolling zonalization works somehow better, gives you a cleaner picture of what you like to have in a background state compared to the rolling time average. Next slide. Now, what are the properties of the new background state? So, um, it, first of all, it can be computed from a single snapshot, which is nice because in particular, you can apply it to forecasts. I mean, if you have a rolling time average, um, you know, the future already influences your background state. So it's hard to apply this to forecasts. It is free of synoptic scale eddies. That's a little bit by design, right? Um, yet it varies smoothly with longitude as desired. And it also varies smoothly with time, right? So it's, it's in an instantaneous. Um, but it varies smoothly with time, and we, we, I, we think we understand that fairly well. Um, so next slide. Um, I, I, here I show you the instantaneous evolution of the background state. So that's a, a Hoffmuller diagram, and the solid lines are the meridional winds, so the typical thing. And you see um, um, a Rusby wave um, traveling across the North Atlantic, and the color is the wave guideability, and then Somewhere um, around the, the, um, the greenish meridian, the Rossby wave just stops. And that seems to be associated with the fact that the wave guideability gets very low. So you have these gray and white colors. And next slide, if you, if you look at a sequence of this waveguide, you see that indeed um, the earlier times, which is the bottom panel on the right hand side, you have a nice waveguide. And even on the 17th, there's still a waveguide, but on the 18th, um, because of this onset of the blocking, the waveguide, the background atmosphere, it gets rid of the waveguide locally. And that's the interesting thing. Next slide. Um, that our metric is local both in time and space. So uh, there's a lack of waveguide only over the North Atlantic, over the rest of the hemisphere. There's a nice waveguide. So if you if you're working with zonal averages, this this would blur out, right? And also, it's local in, 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 time, in, in time, so this, this lack of waveguide only appears on the 18th and earlier there was a nice waveguide. So the fact that it's local both in time and space, we think is, uh, is kind of important to, to diagnose um, synoptic scale episodes. Next slide. 
The remaining challenge is to obtain the wind U from the PV, from the zonalized PV, the rolling zonalized PV through PV inversion. So conceptually, that's very simple. On, of course, if you want to do this in the in the framework of the primitive equations, this is a, a rather challenging. Uh, it's a nonlinear elliptic um, um, problem. I know that Noburu has done this in one of the papers. We are we are, we are trying uh, some some alternative way, version. So that's that's um, work in progress. Next slide. And that brings me to my summary. Next slide. So um, the motivation is to to investigate and better understand the onset of blocking on a zonally varying background state. Uh, we are making heavy use of uh, Noburo's nonlinear theory. Um, one important um, concept is the carrying capacity, like uh, like on a highway. Um, but for specific episodes, one needs a zonally varying zonalized background state. And the idea here is to to do um, to do this the the zonalization in a sector wise rolling fashion. To be sure, you lose certain theorems, and we are aware of that because if you have a finite sector, you have additional boundary terms. But we think that's okay, at least for practical applications. And probably Nabur is going to work out the new theorems then. Um, we, we have shown, I think, that the new background state has uh, some desirable properties, like it's local, both in space and time, and it's free of artifacts, even for high amplitude situations. Next slide. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I also want to take the opportunity to thank Nabora and welcome and the nice summary of the literature and also the explanation of the theory. We know it sometimes takes a little bit much to get through. Now we're going to move on to the next speaker, Joe Wang from UIUC. Thank you, Gan. Um, I'm Zhuo Wang from the University of Illinois. Um, I will talk about the differing onset mechanisms of winter blocking across regions. This work was done with my former student, Doug Miller, and it was supported by NOAA MAP program. Okay, uh, this is the outline of my talk. After a quick introduction, we will look at uh, evolution of blocking structure in different regions. Then we will look at uh, blocking onset mechanisms followed by a shorter summary. There are two, uh, two, general, uh, two groups of theories for blocking onset. Planetary theories emphasize large-scale Raspi waves excited by tropical precipitation anomalies, extratropical SST anomalies, topographic forcing, and inter or due to internal dynamics of the atmosphere. And the local theories emphasize the enhanced uh, transient activity isentropic PV advection or latent heat release. But uh, these theories do not have to be mutually exclusive because uh, different mechanisms can be dominant in different regions, as shown in, uh, in some previous studies. Our study is motivated by this question, how do wintertime blocking onset mechanisms vary from region to region? We are interested in the role of multi-scale interaction, Raspi wheel breaking, and the diabetic heating. We will focus on the boreal winter season, northern hemisphere. We first define the four blocking sectors objectively. The left panel here shows the mean and the standard deviation of blocking frequency as a function of longitude. Here, the uh, black lines represent the uh, uh, mean and the bl uh, blue one represent the standard deviation. Then using uh, UF analysis, we identified uh, four sectors corresponding to the different peaks showing on the, on the left. In the red panel, the different colors represent the different UF modes. From uh, west to east, we have the Atlantic sector, Europe sector, Asian sector, and the Pacific sector. Now let's look at uh, the evolution of blocking structure in different regions. This slide shows the blocking over the Atlantic sector. The top panel shows the composite anomalies of 500 geoplatial height anomalies and also uh, 350 degree uh, isentropic potential vorticity. 
We can see the blocking heights located over Greenland, and the circulation pattern is characterized by a negative phased North Atlantic oscillation. The bottom panel shows the time height cross section. The uh, yellow line represents uh, blocking onset time, or t equal to zero. We can see prior to onset, uh, there are no, uh, positive geopolitical height anomalies descending from stratosphere. In the troposphere, significant anomalies can be detected uh, several days before onset. So this indicates a gradual build-up process leading up to bl uh, uh, blocking onset. Uh, this one shows the Europe sector. Here, the blocking high is located over Scandinavia. It is part of a quadruple structure. In the bottom panel, we can see two, uh, two to four days before blocking onset, there are weak negative geopolitical height anomalies. Within less than two days before onset, positive geopolitical height anomalies appear. So uh, we can, what we see here is a rather abrupt onset process. The abruptness can also be shown in the, uh, in the latitude of pressure cross sections. In the left panel, we see uh, three days before onset. Contours represent geopolitical height anomalies. Here we see a dipole pattern, but uh, we have positive uh, geopolitical height anomalies south of the uh, blocking location and a negative geopolitical height uh, anomalies at the blocking location. This dipole pattern reverses its sign over the next couple of days, and the pattern becomes much stronger. We can see in the uh, red panel, at, uh, at, on the onset date, we have a strong dipole pattern with positive anomalies in the north, extending all the way to the stratosphere. Later, you will see uh, the abruptness is mainly due to the interaction between high frequency and the intermediate, intermediate frequency flow components. For the Asian sector, the blocking high is located over Siberia, and it is part of a circumglobal for the stationary wheel trim pattern. In the bottom panel, we can see positive juvenile height anomalies st uh, start building up several days before, before onset. The stationary wheel pattern is uh, better illustrated in this slide. What we see here is a, a five-day average from 10 days before onset to four, day af four days after onset. In the top panel, you can see the, uh, the uh, we have a, a normal cyclonic circulation over West Europe. And in the subsequent days, the cyclonic circulation becomes stronger and also shift slowly eastward. This leading up to the, uh, leading up to the development of the blocking high over Siberia. Over the Pacific sector, the blocking high is located over Alaska. It is part of a wheel trim pattern that resembles the Pacific North American pattern. The time height cross section in the bottom indicate a downward, a downward propagation of positive geopolitical height anomalies from stratosphere. Now let's look at the different uh, uh, physical mechanisms for the different regions. To look at a multi scale interaction, we separated uh, the total anomaly field uh, into three uh, frequency bands. Hi, uh, this, is, uh, this, is to, uh, this follows the previous study by Renard and Wallace in 2009. The high frequency band covers a period less than six days. The, uh, it's often associated with eastward propagating baroclinical waves. And the intermediate frequency band is for, from six days to uh, 30 days often associated with stationary raspberry wheel trains. And the low frequency band is for a period longer than 30 days and often tied to planetary scale teleconnection patterns. We used the PV budget analysis to, stu uh, to study uh, blocking development. In the equation here, the left one is the local PV tendency. On the right, we have convergence of horizontal PV flux, vertical PV flux, diabetic production, and the residual term. For each variable, we uh, decompose it into four terms. Here, subscript C represents the long-term mean seasonal cycle, and the other three components represent the low frequency, intermediate frequency, and the high frequency components. 
when we plug in the decomposition into the horizontal PV flux, we would get uh, uh, 16 terms. But we found the terms associated with the long-term mean seasonal uh, cycle are negligible. So in the end, we, uh, the equation can be simplified with nine terms for the uh, horizontal PV flux as shown in the bottom. We also used the uh, uh, backward tra trajectory analysis, and the puzzle evolution is analyzed in the DPD theta phase uh, parameter space. As shown, on the, as shown on the right, the horizontal axis represents changes in potential temperature over three days before blocking onset. So the left occurrence represents the cooling, and the right occurrence represents the heating. The vertical axis represent a pressure change over the three days. The top occurrence represent the sinking motion, and the bottom occurrence represent the rising motion. Over the Atlantic sector, we are uh, the here are uh, panel ABC represent uh, different terms in the PV budget equation, and we also use the colored contours to highlight a wheel, uh, raspy wave breaking. Here, a uh, cyan contour represents uh, cyclonic Rossby wave breaking, and orange contours represent uh, anti-cyclonic Rossby wave breaking. We can see for the blocking high over Atlantic sector, it is associated with enhanced uh, cyclonic Rossby wave breaking west of Greenland. The negative PV tendency in the blocking region can be attributed to divergence of horizontal PV flux in panel B and the diabetic heating production uh, in, uh, in panel C. But the heating contribution mainly occurs in the, uh, in the east of the blocking high, and the horizontal uh, PV flux makes the primary contribution in the west. In, the, uh, in panel D, we see the backward trajectory analysis. About 45% of the particles associated with the upward motion and subject to heating, which is consistent with the strong contribution of diabetic heating to blocking onset in the PV budget analysis. Uh, here we see the horizontal P, uh, PV flux decomposition. The nine panels represent the interaction of the three frequency bands. And what we see here is the, the dominant contribution by the uh, due to uh, due to the uh, f transport of intermediate frequency potential vorticity by the low frequency wind, and this is consistent with the rather gradual build up uh, build up process of blocking onset for this sector. Over Europe sector, we can see blocking onset is tied to uh, an, ext an extensive region of anti-cyclonic Rossby wave breaking, as highlighted by the uh, yellow con uh, contour here. And the negative PV tendency is uh, tied to horizontal PV, uh, PV flux divergence and also diabetic heating. In the last panel, we can see about 35% of particles are subject to heating and upward motion. In the horizontal PV flux decomposition, we see a strong contribution by, due to the interaction between intermediate frequency and high frequency flow components. This is consistent with the sharp, uh, the abrupt onset of blocking in this sector, and it is in contrast to the uh, to the Atlantic sector. I uh, recall that the blocking onset over the Asian, Asian sector is part of a stationary wave trend pattern, and here we don't see uh, strong signals of Raspi wave breaking. Also, you can see the PV uh, negative PV uh, tendency here is uh, weaker than the other two sectors, Atlantic or Europe sector, and the contribution of diabetic heating in panel C is also much weaker. In the uh, last panel, you can see only 30% of the particles uh, are subject to heating. In contrast, uh, we can see uh, a large number of particles cluster around the origin point of the parameter space, which means uh, Adiabatic or asentropic advection plays an important role here. Over the Pacific sector, first we can see blocking is associated with cyclonic Raspberry wheel breaking in the West, and also we have a strong negative PV tendency. But interestingly, in this region, the negative PV tendency cannot be fully explained by either heating or horizontal PV flux. 
Instead, we, we found an important contribution by the vertical transport or PV flux from the stratosphere. That is also consistent with the, the backward trajectory analysis. In the last panel, you can see about 25% of the particles are subject to sinking and, and, and cooling from the stratosphere. And this number, 25%, is the largest among the four sectors. The importance of the uh, stratospheric processes can also be illustrated in the composite anomalies of 70 millibar Jupiter height. What we see here is the uh, five-day average from 10 days before onset to four days after onset. 10 days before blocking onset, you can see the polar vortex is displaced over North America. And the, uh, from five days before to four days after blocking onset, there are strong positive anomalies of Jupiter height over North Pacific. And we think such precursors may serve as a, a useful predictor for blocking onset in this sector. Okay, here is a quick summary. Uh, the take home message is uh, blocking onset mechanisms can be different in different regions. More specifically, Atlantic blocking is associated with low frequency flow evolution and influenced by cyclonic Rossby wheel breaking. Europe blocking onset is rather abrupt and tied to the interaction of high frequency and intermediate frequency interaction. And uh, it is also associated with anticyclonic uh, raspberry wheel break, uh, breaking. Asian blocking is a part of the stationary wheel trim pattern, but it does not have a strong signature in raspberry wheel breaking. Pas uh, Pacific sector blocking is influenced by processes from the stratosphere. We found a strong contribution of diabetic heating to blocking over Atlantic, Europe, and the Pacific, but not over uh, Asia. This is consistent with the previous st uh, studies emphasizing diabetic heating over uh, oceanic regions. The analysis leads to some interesting questions, such as uh, are the future changes of blocking different in, di in different sectors? Do we have different levels of predictability for different mechanisms? This would be interesting topics for future study. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe, for a very comprehensive study. So our next speaker is Talia from MIT, uh, who's going to tell us more about raspberry wave breaking. So, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for this really great workshop. Um, and I hope you guys still have a little bit of energy for the last talk of the session. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this work was done in collaboration with Nili Harnik from Tel Aviv University. And here um, we wanted to look at the three-way feedback between Rossby wave breakings, uh, low frequency circulation regimes, and surface weather, cyclones and anticyclones. If it works. Yes. Okay. So just a quick uh, sort of reminder, Rossby wave breaking described the, the last stage in the life cycle of atmospheric waves. And when these waves um, are large enough, so they start breaking nonlinearly and irreversibly, returning their energy to the mean flow. And Thorncroft in his famous paper from 93, identified uh, two types of wave breaking. <clears throat> he called them LC1 and LC2. LC1 uh, is, is essentially the anticyclonic wave breaking type, and LC2 is the cyclonic wave breaking type. So the breaking is, is essentially the overturning uh, of the, in this case, PV contours. And in both cases, the breaking uh, implies a reversal of the PV gradient. So the ridge, or in our case, uh, you can think about it as the block, will be more poleward of the trough. So Rossby wave breaking events are also closely related to blocking events. Okay, now thinking about Rossby wave breakings and weather regimes. So Rossby wave breaking events are more generally related to weather regimes, which are persistent and slowly varying states of the large scale atmospheric circulation. For example, um, there's been quite a lot of previous studies uh, that suggested a relation between the positive NAO and anticyclonic wave breaking, which result in a more tilted and northward jet regime, uh, and the negative NAO with cyclonic wave breaking events, resulting in a more zonal and southward jet regime. 
Similarly, um, a, a paper by Strong and Magnus Daughter looked at composites of sea level pressure anomalies during anticyclonic and cyclonic wave breaking events, and they found these uh, interesting sea level pressure dipoles of opposite sign uh, that overall look very similar to the positive and negative polarities of the NAO. But I guess the, the sort of question that we were asking ourselves are, are these sea level pressure um, anomalies during the wave breaking events, are these short time scale cyclones and anticyclones or are these low frequency slowly varying weather regimes what is the sort of interaction between the short time scale and the long time scale okay so for Rossby wave breaking and weather systems so i think um, by now uh, it is strongly agreed that cyclones can through latent heat release and diabetic heating in the warm conveyor but significantly influence the upper level ridge or block which then often terminates in a wave breaking event in the downstream region. So cyclones can uh, contribute to wave breaking and blocks in their downstream. On the other hand, um, it has also been suggested that wave breaking can influence the tracks of cyclones uh, as well as their intensity. For example, if you have concurrent uh, cyclonic wave breaking uh, on the poleward side and anticyclonic wave breaking on the equatorward side, that means you have a stronger PV gradient between them, so you get a very strong jet, uh, which uh, gives favorable conditions for cyclone growth, and also it's very zonal, so it leads the cyclone directly towards Europe, leading to enhanced destructiveness and so on. So the key questions we wanted to address here is what is um, the three-way interaction between low frequency flow, the regimes, Rossby wave breaking, and surface weather systems. But first, we wanted to ask, uh, to start with a simpler question, what is the relation between Rossby wave breaking events and surface uh, weather systems? And if we understand that, then we can start thinking about how the slowly varying weather regimes influence this interaction, and how does this interaction feeds back to impact the weather regimes? I can't say we answered all of these questions, but these are the kind of things that we're trying to understand. So the, the, the way we do it is we combine um, three things. The Rossby wave breaking detection algorithm based on the 250 hectopascal PV contours. We have a storm tracking algorithm based on 850 hectopascal vorticity field to identify cyclones and anticyclones. And we have a K-min clustering technique for the 500 geopotential height anomalies to identify weather regimes, and we do it for the North Atlantic. So the first thing we did is just to look at composites of, of anticyclonic wave breaking events and cyclonic wave breaking events, and just plotting the locations, the relative locations of cyclones on the left column and anticyclones on the right column, relative to the center of the breaking. So the first row is anticyclonic wave breaking, the second row is cyclonic wave breaking. And the, the color here indicates the intensity of the weather system in, in vorticity units. It's uh, normalized. Um, so for anticyclonic wave breaking, uh, so first of all, you can see that you get really these um, organized structures in terms of where you find cyclones and anticyclones, which, which is kind of nice. So for anticyclones, we find that, interestingly, there are two main regions where you would find cyclones either to the northwest of the anticyclonic wave breaking or to the southeast. And you would tend to find anticyclones between them. So you have sort of this tripod structure, cyclone, anticyclone, cyclone, with a tilted structure. For cyclonic wave breaking events, you tend to find cyclones um, close to the breaking center and anticyclones to their northeast. Now, this structure actually look very much like what you get if you just look, look at composites of, for example, relative uh, vorticity at the 850 level. So you see this tripod for anticyclonic wave breaking and a, a dipole for cyclonic wave breaking with opposite um, tilts. And it's actually also, it looks very much like the sea level pressure composites of Strong and Magnus Daughter, but crucially, it shows you that these are actual cyclones and anticyclones that gives rise to these sea level pressure dipoles, which can, which can then project to give something in the, in, the, in, the, in the timing to the weather regimes, to give them their sort of persistence. So um, if I go back, yeah, no, right. Okay, so just one more thing to, to note here is that you, you would maybe think that anticyclones are more related to anticyclonic wave breaking and cyclones to cyclonic wave breaking, but you can see here that this is not the case. 
both types of weather systems actually uh, are related to both types of wave, wave breaking events. And, and they actually, you can find them in, in, in similar frequencies. And so what we did next is we decided to j just look at composites of cyclones and anticyclones, but condition on whether they involved an anticyclonic wave breaking or a cyclonic wave breaking. So here I'm showing you composite over anticyclones, uh, but those that participated in anticyclonic wave breaking from two days before the breaking maximum and up to t equals zero, that's the maximum breaking. And I'm showing you the upper level PV anomaly, as well as the sea level pressure anomalies uh, in contours. And what, what we found is that um, you start with an, a low level anticyclone with a cyclone to its west. And then during the evolution of the breaking, or maybe I'll, I'll mention that crucially, the anticyclone and the upper level ridge are located in the anticyclonic side of the, of the background shear. I'm not trying it to you, but they are. And then during the evolution of the breaking, what happens is that the whole system rotates anticyclonically. So uh, at upper level, the trough starts wrapping around anticyclonically around the, the block or the ridge. And at, at low level, the cyclone and the anticyclone rotates anticyclonically such that by the end of the breaking, the cyclone is to the north of the anticyclone. And this is the sort of uh, uh, the sea level pressure dipole that we saw that reflects on the negative or positive NAO. Uh, similarly, but opposite what we find for cyclones during cyclonic wave breaking, in this case, the cyclone trough are on the cyclonic side of the background she shear. Uh, and the overall um, relative rotation is cyclonic, such that the ridge or the trough, uh, the, the ridge or the block is to the north of the trough, and, and also the anticyclone is to the north of the cyclone. But we also looked at the same sort of composites over cyclones and anticyclones, but now looking at opposite sense pairing. So um, opposite sense breaking and weather system type. So for example, if you look at the first row, this is now composites on anticyclones, but those that involve the cyclonic wave breaking. And you can see how different it, the time evolution is compared to anticyclones during anticyclonic wave breaking. For the anticyclonic wave breaking, it was the downstream trough that starts deepening and was wrapping around anticyclonically around the, the block. But in this case, it's the upstream uh, a trough that starts deepening and the relative rotation is actually cyclonic. So it's, uh, if you look at the anomalous velocities, they're anticyclonic because you're um, looking at composites over anticyclones, but even though they're anticyclonic, the relative rotation is cyclonic because the shear wins. Similarly, for cyclones during anticyclonic wave breaking, you find anticyclonic relative rotation. So this is just to summarize it sort of schematically what we find, and I'm only concentrating on the anticyclones now because um, of their relation to clocks. So there are two types of evolutions that can involve blocking. The first um, would be an anticyclone or a block that would end up with an anticyclonic wave breaking. In this sense, the relative rotation of the block, um, and the, the anomalous velocities associated with the block and the overall rotation of the system, they're both anticyclonic, but you can also think about anticyclones participating in cyclonic wave breaking, which will have a cyclonic relative rotation. Um, and in, interestingly, in both cases, you find a cyclone to the west of the, a cyclone to the west of the anticyclone. And the cyclone to the west is consistent with the upstream cyclone theory suggested for blockings. Uh, and it's also consistent with those studies about the role of the upstream one conveyor belt. Um, and this upstream cyclone was also shown important for the predictability of the block onset. But interestingly, what we're saying here, that even though in both cases there is an upstream cyclone, um, it still can involve either an anticyclonic wave breaking or a cyclonic wave breaking, depending on the position relative to the background jet uh, with, with, with the corresponding relative rotation in each case. So that might be important for, for predictability of, of blocks. Um, so I'm saying, essentially, I think we know that we can get block either during um, cyclonic wave breaking event or during anticyclonic wave breaking event, and potentially the relative rotation compared to the jet might be really crucial in determining the overall uh, evolution. And just to show you that these are real, that you can get both types. So on the left is just a composite over blocks um, over, over Europe, which are 
gener generally associated with anticyclonic wave breaking, and it's showing you the, the PV anomalies, and you can really see the anticyclonic relative rotation of the region, the trough, whereas uh, on the right is just uh, an example of a blocking episode. This is from Lupo and Smith. Um, and you can see um, that the block was actually, the block uh, and the trough had a cyclonic relative rotation. So both cases are uh, found in, in the real atmosphere and it's worth thinking a little bit more about it. And then the relation to weather regimes. So this was just Rossby wave breaking and surface cyclones and anticyclones, but now complicated a little, complicated it uh, a little bit more. We think about the weather regimes. So what is the three-way interaction between low frequency flows, Rossby wave breaking and low, and low level cyclones and anticyclones? So what we did next is we just looked at uh, six weather regimes in the North Atlantic. So we have Atlantic Ridge and Trough, Scandinavian Ridge and Trough, and positive and negative NAO. And first of all, we just looked at the tracks of cyclones and anticyclones. Uh, oops, sorry. How do I go back? Yeah, okay. We just looked at the tracks Okay, the tracks of cyclones and anticyclones in each uh, weather regime, and you can see how different they are. Um, and interestingly, it turns out that to first order, you can sort of understand the tracks if you think about the selective absorption mechanism. So it was mentioned earlier in the session um, by Yamazaki and Itu. Um, and the basic idea of the selective absorption mechanism is that if you have a large vortex, you can think about um, how sort of um, you can you can think about how it will advect lower scale um, smaller uh, scale vortices and it's essentially like thinking about the effective beta um, like for for example over um, in, in Earth cyclones tend to propagate towards the pole because of the beta drift so something similar here if you think about the gradient of PV due to these larger vortices. So essentially, a block would tend to advect towards it um, high um, weather systems and repel the low weather systems, the low pressure. Um, so in other words, anticyclones seem to travel through the low frequency ridges while the cyclones are deflected by it. And cyclones can travel through the low frequency troughs while anticyclones are deflected by it. And, and then I'm, I'm out of time. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. Uh, and then we were just looking at where um, the breaking actually occurs in each weather regime. And you can see they're very different. In some cases, you have more anticyclonic wave breaking, in others, more cyclonic wave breaking. And the idea that we're suggesting is that the slowly varying flow influences the tracks of cyclones and anticyclones, which in turn determine the location of the anticyclonic and cyclonic wave breakings. And the last thing we did is to look at why in some cases, for example, uh, Atlantic Ridge, anticy anticyclones during anticyclonic wave breaking give a really nice signature of anticyclonic wave breaking, whereas in other cases like the negative NAO, it, the, the, the anticyclonic wave breaking is not very successful. So I'll skip this, but the point is that you can see that uh, when the breaking is very successful, it's where the high frequency is reinforcing the low frequency. Essentially, essentially they sit one on top of each other, reinforcing the circulation. Um, and I'll stop here and I'll just say that uh, the summary is that low level cyclones and anticyclones are fundamentally related to the upper level wave breaking. And then we're suggesting that the slowly varying weather regimes can influence the tracks of low level cyclones and anticyclones, potentially through the selective absorption mechanism, which in turn can influence where the wave breaking occurs. And then depending on where the wave breaking occurs with respect to the low frequency flow, the wave breaking uh, can either feed back positively or negatively on the weather regime. And then open question is how to better quantify these suggested relations. Can we prove causality? It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, and can we show that the Rossby wave breaking contribute to the persistence of the weather regimes? And thank you.
going to invite all the speaker back to the stage. I'm also going to turn the floor to my co-chair, Jen Lu, who's going to moderate. As a reminder for anyone online who wasn't able to join us earlier, if you have a question, if you can please uh, put your hand up and uh, we'll call on you to ask your question. So uh, if you guys feel like uh, you know, have a stretch, <laughs> relax a little bit, yeah, feel free to do so. And uh, uh, question, okay, now, uh, I, just one second. Let me check with the uh, work are, are you with us, uh, work -more? Yes, I am. I'm still, I am still online. Great, excellent. So, all right, I see you already. Uh, yeah. Hello, yeah. thank you for all those excellent talks. Um, this one, this question's for Dr. Wong. So, uh, I think it was last year. It was a nice paper that came out by Patrick Martineau and Yuka Saka and um, Sashi Nakamura. Um, so, they talked about how baroclinic conversion from mean state potential energy to eddy available potential energy was very critical for blocking formation and maintenance and, and all that. Um, so I was wondering, is that compatible with what you were showing? And then where would that kind of interaction show up in your, in your formalism that you were using? Yeah, so just hold, hold the button. Okay. Uh, first, I need to admit, I did not read that paper. <laughs> Uh, after my student graduated, I, actually, I, uh, I did not continue the blocking research. Uh, but based on your question, I, I would say like uh, uh, we can we should be able to see some uh, features or some information from the uh, PV budget analysis, the interaction between be, uh, across different time scales. Yeah, I hope to follow up with you with more information after I read that paper. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Oh, yep. oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my question is for uh, Professor Worth. Uh, Please also state your name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Lua Lawi. I'm from uh, the University of British Columbia. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. My uh, question was, uh, right, uh, I was just curious as to, is it already known as to why the waveguides in some regions might be weaker than others, like uh, the figure you showed in the Western North Atlantic had uh, right, like a weaker kind of waveguide in that region. Is it like a known thing or is there like a theory as to what drives uh, the background state in that region? I think there is some limited amount of theory uh, about that. I think your high Caspi from Israel once had an interesting paper and, and I think also people from England that a storm track, I mean, the, the, the strength of the jet has to do uh, over the Western North Atlantic has to do with a strong meridional gradient of sea surface temperature. That's the location and the form and shape of North America, actually, sort of in winter, that's the cold continent and the, the warm water. And then that generates for cleaning instability. And as the, the, the waves travel downstream, they kind of destroy the, the storm track destroys itself. So there's a tendency for the storm track to get weaker and that is associated with a with a weaker jet. So that's kind of a very broad brush um, the, the summary of what people have found. So I think there is a, a bit of theory trying to explain that. Yes, I would say. All right, thank you so much. So the lady raised hand before, so go ahead, yeah. And my name is Winita, and my question is to Talia. Uh, you, it was a great talk, by the way. Different uh, wave breaking activity. I just, I'm just curious into understanding: is there any significant characteristics difference in the blocking formed by uh, anticyclonic or cyclonic wave breaking activity? Like, I know there would be some structural differences, but is there any significant characteristics like persistence or spatial size or something that you can comment about? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It's not something I've looked at yet, uh, but I think it might be important um, for because the time development is so different, just where the block goes, it either goes upstream or downstream sort of. Um, so I think for um, block predictability, it could be really important. 
Um, in terms of persistence, intensities, and so on, um, it's not something I've looked at, but I think uh, it might be insightful and interesting. Might be different. Yeah. Tanya, actually, I have a quick follow up question. So, do you think the anti cyclonic versus cyclonic brain, which one is more predictable or persistent? Um, again, I, I don't know. I, it, these are all really good questions. Um, I mean, you definitely know where you get more of, like in each region, you get more frequently different types of breaking. Like in the upstream of the Atlantic, you get more cyclonic wave breaking in general. So there you would get more um, these sort of blocks that uh, go, like that rotate cyclonically. So they go sort of upstream. And the downstream, you get more of the anticyclonic wave breaking over Europe. Um, so definitely regional differences, uh, but in terms of predictability, I don't know. It's something I want to look at. Yeah. I make a quick uh, speculation. Um, I think in uh, Soundcraft's paper, uh, he mentioned that I think the LC1 or cyclonic wave breaking is more persistent. But I think this will be really difficult to diagnose with observational data. Like in different regions, like diabetic heating or other processes may make a different contribution. But it, it may be something interesting to explore using idealized model simulations. Thank you. Does anyone online have a question? I saw a hand up and I think it went down. So we'll make sure you get your chance. Um, I have a question for Naburu. Um, so I think uh, I, I enjoy um, go through all the history of all uh, amazing series. Um, I, I wonder at the end of the day, what would be a good series? So what would be your criteria to say this series is good enough? Uh, and because in my mind, uh, very naively, I, 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 when I think of series, I, I always think of you know a bunch of uh, criteria you pr prescribe be be before you see the block. And then the block occur, and then you say the series is good. Uh, none of the series is doing that, as far as I know. Uh, so I wonder, is that going to be a possibility in the near future? And what's in your mind regarding, you know, uh, a, a really a, a effective series? Right. So it would be good to have a predictive theory. Of block. So I mean, there are different theories, um, quote unquote theories. I mean, um, if you have a theory that sort of predicts um, particular event that is probably very difficult. Um, but in general, uh, you know, what is the favorable condition for blocking uh, block formation, for example? And if a theory can identify a few small number of parameters that are critical for block formation, if we get combination of these uh, parameter uh, situations, then you have a high probability of blocking. And if you, if you can do that, I think it will be a very pr uh, successful predictive theory. Um, and then, then there are a whole host of diagnostic theories. I mean, it's more like a framework rather than just a predictive, but it's, it's also important because I, I think when, when, when I looked at local wave activity, we, we just uh, you know, wanted to, to have some kind of diagnostic framework. Um, the theory of blocking, um, emerged from that. So I think there is some synergy between the diagnosis and, and, and the predictive series. I'm not sure if that answers your question. I want to add on to that. So I see the summer school you were um, putting on your PowerPoint earlier, it was saying uh, climate and extreme events. So I'm wondering, should we differentiate climate extremes and weather extremes? And since it's the, the time um, period is different, should we like develop different theories or we should really break down theories in different time periods to add into the theory like gap between larger scale and smaller scale? Yeah, so I, I think the title the Rossi Palooza is just just by uh, students, so I, I don't know what what they're thinking uh, is, but I think I, I can probably offer my perspective on this. So um, it, it, I think it's, it, it, to some extent it's sort of semantic, I mean, you know, weather extremes and so, so the climate related extremes. But um, 
I, for example, the kind of extreme events that Lance talked about this morning, you know, the question, you know, just to frame this question uh, in the spirit of amending the weather climate schism is one way of doing this is to, to ask how frequent this type of event occurs. And so, you know, eventually we want to build a probability distribution or at the least the average return period of such events for particular reasons. And so you can sort of bring in some statistical perspective to extreme events. So the extreme events themselves um, are, you know, on, on short time scales, they are all, you know, evolved from a deterministic uh, mechanisms. But of course, we can't really predict extreme events, you know, decades ahead of time. Uh, so we can only rely on statistical inferences. But then if we can just sort of bridge the gap uh, between the climate variability and extreme events um, from, say, storyline approaches that, you know, if the climate change affects the background state uh, on which uh, extreme events occur, uh, and what, what is the connection between uh, the climate, long-term climate variation and the likelihood of um, extreme weather events under such conditions and so we can we there, there are some ways of linking um you know um, climate change and extreme events without really you know resorting to the full-fledged climate simulations and high resolution um you know, there are smarter ways so <clears throat> i have a more of a diagnostic question so in the beginning we talk about wave activity then we we talked about wave breaking in this last two talk. So can we, um, if we see a large wave activity, can we know it's a breaking wave or just a large amplitude wave? Good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, again, it's um, um, so if you really want to to look at the the data, I think we we want to. Uh, it, it depends on your definition of wave breaking, but if you just refer to the, the morphology of, say, the overturning potential vorticity contours, then you definitely would like to, to look at potential vorticity than just wave activity. And, um, you know, you can have, in theory, have large wave activity without creating overturning of potential vorticity contours. And so um, the answer is, yeah, you, you have to... Uh, have to, uh, to 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 discern it carefully because wave activity is just that, and uh, it, it sort of quantifies the the uh, the, the degree of meridional displacement potential vorticity contour. It doesn't tell you whether the PV contour is overturned, and and on the way to uh, uh, the irreversible mixing. Although I think um, if you just look at many cases, that there are pretty high correlation between large wave events, uh, large. Uh, wave activity in the tail end of the distribution really uh, looks like uh, you know part of the large wave breaking events and and irreversibility and mixing events um, uh, involved. So so there is a high correlation, but uh, simple answer is you you don't know until you really look at carefully. Uh, may I add something? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with Naboro. Um, Generally speaking, when you have a strong or large amplitude waves, uh, it, uh, the, uh, it is more likely to have wave breaking, but it also depends on like a background PV gradient. If the background PV gradient is strong, uh, it may not break. Also, like uh, we often focus on like strong events, strong uh, raspberry wheel packets, strong raspberry wheel breaking. Also stronger raspberry wheel breaking uh, is, is more likely to lead to blocking. But I think the weaker events, like uh, they occur more frequently, the cumulative effect to the mean flow may not be negligible. Maybe they can like uh, affect uh, or precondition blocking in some indirect ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm on the left. I'm Norti Numrani from uh, Pierkin Center of Climate Research in uh, Norway. Uh, the question is uh, for uh, Noboru and for Bert. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, normally uh, uh, downstream of the storm trick region, we have stationary ridge in the Euro-Atlantic region. And uh, from the perspective of uh, Professor Vert, I think this can contribute to the, to the change of the westerly 
to this uh, decrease of the westerly from the storm track uh, to the to the downstream and the question how to understand this the role of this reach from the perspective of the of the traffic jam theory it's um it's sort of an integral part of um traffic jam theory particularly for the northern hemisphere um it the ridge differently it plays a role of localization of walking um without any um stationary adulation of the jet stream through to stationary you know ridges um and you will probably have almost equal probability of walking anywhere along the jet stream you can still have jet stream when when the threshold wave activity of, um is is reached but um definitely having the regional variation of the jet stream speed uh, forced by the stationary Rossby wave uh, affects the localization or just the regions of preferred uh, block formation, preferred regions of block formation. May I elaborate on that? I mean, a stationary ridge, usually, you wouldn't, wouldn't you get that only in the case when, when you get this transition to a blocking? And uh, as long as the carrying capacity has not been exceeded, I mean, the waves um, would travel downstream and you would see much of a ridge, would you? Well, again, I think, you know, it, it, it depends on, I mean, probably we should probably compare the, the climatology, the time average and your version of rolling um, zonalization um, to, to look at the distribution of wave activity. But I think from my um, a limited experience with climatology, certainly climatological mean uh, zonal wind, um, it clearly shows wave number two, the ridges um, in the winter northern hemisphere on uh, over the Rockies and, and and Europe. So you know that that may be part of uh, the response uh, from the the block themselves, blocks themselves. But uh, and I wouldn't be surprised that part of part of that is forced by, for example, warm warm sea surface temperatures over the Atlantic, for example. Uh, would definitely affect the defluent structure of the jets. Um, this is a bit of an off the wall question, but what happens do you think could happen when you have a big cold surge on the east of the Rockies and you have a 1050 hectopascal high coming down? The end result of often that process is a sub 950 bomb cyclone in the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, how often does that trigger a block? Um, and can it be tied back in any way to terrain channel flow down the east side of the Rockies? So the, what, what might roll at the north-south mountain barriers as opposed to the Tibetan plateau, which is east-west oriented in the evolution of blocking patterns? Are, are you talking about the blocks over the U.S. or the blocks for the Block downstream. 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 You get a big trough in the eastern part of North America, and you get a big cyclogenesis up, which produces a huge surge of warm air up over the eastern Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, so that, that so this is an interesting question. I think uh, certainly the cyclogenesis uh, or the seaboard of U.S. Uh, is a ma major source of wave activity down downstream, and therefore this is sort of triggered triggers uh, downstream development of block formation. But then again, it's a combination of the, of the upstream seeding of eddies and the local and you know, the jet stream uh, over the region of, of block formation. So, so sort of when, when you have an optimal combination of the two, uh, that, will, that will trigger. And so it, it, it takes uh, a quite subtle combination of, of the parameters to, to get block formations. And so I think this is one of the reasons why we get occasional uh, forecast busts uh, for block formation. For example, a good example is that April. Of 2011, when we have this major, uh, you know, uh, tornado outbreak over in uh, North America, uh, and, and 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 the representation of the convection in that region uh, was insufficient to predict the downstream block formation uh, that that happened probably a few days later over Europe, and that caused a major, uh, you know, uh, forecast bust, and so. What's happening in the upstream definitely plays a major role uh, in in the downstream, but how often uh, and 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 how 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 intense it's it's a good question. Yeah, I think the atmosphere has more flavors of blocking than we can deal with as humans. <laughs> <clears throat> Any more questions? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, uh, thank for the nice talks. I'm Jun Suk from University of Chicago. I have a question for Talia. Uh, you showed a nice Lagrangian analysis in the cases of various regimes, and I wonder uh, if you would do the similar analysis using Eulerian uh, statistics. Would you find something more interesting, or what's uh, motivation for your Lagrangian analysis? I think that's what I want to further understand. Um, I mean, I, I, actually, I would be happy to understand a little bit more what specifically are you asking about? Like, I think the Lagrangian, um, the idea was to try to look at that, how the tracks of cyclones and anticyclones um, differ depending on the weather regime. This is actually where we started the whole thing. Um, and then in, in, in this sense, it makes sense to use the Lagrangian feature tracking of cyclones and anticyclones. Um, but then we realized that the interaction must go through the Rossby wave breaking. Um, and then we wanted to see the sort of arrangement of surface weather systems around the breaking, try to understand more the dynamics from a synoptic scale perspective. So um, that's why we use, again, the Lagrangian feature tracking. I, I mean, if you do an Eulerian perspective, I'm not sure how you would you know, tackle any of these questions. Um, and, and, and yeah, so. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so actually, it's an let's say an open question to for all of the four speakers. And uh, thank you so much. Theory is very complicated, but still, uh, it's it's good to have the quick summary of all the theories. The thing is, uh, we always uh, are talking about reversal mechanism or let's say PV gradient theory, different theories, but. Uh, can we think about blocking intensity as if, because sometimes the blocking episodes are uh, usually, let's take an example of North Pacific, uh, Northwest Pacific heat wave of 2021. I observed that uh, once uh, the geopotential height gradient reaches maximum to almost 240 meters. So it's like massive. And in our criteria, we say that it should be, let's say greater than zero to qualify as a blocking regime in, in the flow reversal mechanism. Uh, so do we have to think about uh, maybe classifying the blocking episodes as per their intensities in order to understand the uh, extreme events? Maybe like, you know, for example, high intensity blocking events could be um, an indication of uh, intense extreme events or something like that. And just one quick question to Professor Walkma. Uh, it's like you mentioned about rolling zonalization is better than uh, rolling time average. Uh, I just wanted to ask whether uh, the specific observation that you form is applicable to other uh, sectors as well, or just like specifically to, because the sector that you showed, uh, let's say is a bit on the high latitude blocking regime, but whether that could be validated or like, uh, have you found anything related to that? Thank you. Maybe I may, may I may start um, this this last question. I mean, we were focusing on mid latitude on the mid latitudes, and our sector I believe goes all the way. I mean, we are working in the framework of the primitive equation, so the sector in latitude goes all the way from the pole to the equator. So I think, I think our results should not sensitively de depend on the region. I was of course taking examples from the North Atlantic because you have nice blocking over the North Atlantic. Um, but I think uh, these these results that it's I mean, for instance, that the that the rolling zonalized state is always uh, monotonic. That carries that's by design, so that carries over where, wherever you do the analysis. So I think most of the properties of the rolling zonalized background state I think carry through um, throughout the the hemisphere. I would say. The question about the intensity of blocking, and I think at the end of the day, we want to know whether a particular block produces extreme condition surface. Um, and certainly, I think there is some correlation between, say, the uh, geopotential height anomaly. And, you know, the, the elevated geopotential height means that the layer thickness uh, is, is greater, so that the layer mean temperature is higher, so that it's conducive to heat wave. Um, in certain sense, but um, but then again, um, you know, the intensity 
um, measured as an amplitude of waviness. It's just one measure, but I think, uh, for example, the duration, persistence of, of, of a block and of the size of the block, probably these metrics are correlated one way or the other, uh, and, and they, they, they affect uh, the local weather differently. And so, the, you know, I certainly um, tend to first think about how large the wave amplitude is, but then I think we also have to consider um, duration, persistence, and, um, and the, the spatial extent of an event um, to, to really come connect the blocking event to, to extreme weather. So, so maybe, maybe Lisa, just, do we have any questions online? Yeah, yeah that's maybe. what I was just, um, I don't see any. Does anyone have any questions online? Sims, uh, Omar has something, uh, Okuma has something to add. Yeah, just a, a small addition to what Noburo said. You know, it turns out that, I mean, in my experience anyways, that local wave activity, Noburo's local wave activity picks out blocking very well, actually. So whenever you have a large blob of local wave activity, you, you, can, you know, it's almost always blocking. Um, I'm not aware of any study investigating uh, different strength of blocking. So, so I, I couldn't answer the question except saying that maybe local wave activity is a, is a good metric to study that. Melissa? This is kind of a maybe rambly, um, but I'm picking up on kind of, there's universal theories of blocking that don't really depend on what region in the actual atmosphere that you're um, thinking about, um, you know, eddy straining or wave breaking is kind of something that is the same no matter where it is. But then there's clearly um, all this evidence for regional differences in the actual amplification of blocks. Um, so I'm just trying to piece together how we can kind of resolve those, or I'm wondering um, if we're trying to build a predictive model of blocking, um, should we be weighing the regional characteristics more than the universal, or um, is that the wrong way to think about it? We have to consider all of it, or um, I don't know, just like the question of predictability, um, is regional or universal blocking um, mechanisms, are they more important, or are they all important? Just to uh, improve, understand and improve the, the predictability of regional block formation, I think it's very important to, to look at the, the background flow that Wolfman was, was talking about. I think the defluence of the jet, the larger scale of modulation of the jet stream really affects the, the locations of block formation. And that's probably one, the num number one predictor of the, the most likely locations uh, of a block formation. So without getting that part of the information right, you probably don't have a very good uh, skill set for, for the regional predictions. But even you know, uh, having that information right, it, it, it block uh, prediction of the particular block blocking event is a difficult uh, you know uh, enterprise actually. Uh, so, uh, but but uh, I think there there were some studies um, indicating that, uh, that that having the the correct background flow itself uh, will improve the the block formation. Yeah, probably we have a later session to discuss this. But uh, climate model centers, for example, underestimate uh, the block formation over the the North Atlantic sector. Uh, but uh, this is part of the reasons that the background state is sort of. Uh, it's not uh, predicted correctly, and then it's sort of a chicken and egg problem because blocking does affect the background state flow and and so forth. But uh, but if you get the correct background flow, that will definitely improve the frequency and and uh, and the geography geographic locations of of blocks. So, so that's that's the first thing I would um, aim to fix. Have a chance. Before awesome. We, uh, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, so. uh, yeah, maybe one more comment, and that puts us puts us at time. Oh. The panelists have anything else to add? You no. Know, before we conclude, it's about time. <laughs> time for a break. Um, I agree with Nobura. I think the like the universal theories are important. Like the models need to get that uh, right to get the like the general distribution correct or climatology right. But uh, in the end, we need to like uh, pre well, in terms of like extremes or impacts, we uh, we would come to the regional scale. 
when we come to the regional scale, I think the like the blocking uh, characteristics like duration intensity would be strongly modul uh, modulated by some uh, maybe secondary processes like the impacts of like diabetic heating or topography or uh, also the mean flow effect whether you have like cyclonic or anti-cyclonic raspberry wave breaking where you would have the blocking those would be determined by or strongly affected by the regional uh, regional mean flow features.